Um, welcome everybody, the people in the room and the people online. Welcome to this open meeting of the Geographical Sciences Committee. I'm Carol Harden. I chair the committee. Today we have the opportunity to consider the effects of energy transmission transition, sorry, on opportunities in rural America. So the way this is going to work is we'll start off with just a few introductions and I'll make it just a couple comments to kind of set the stage for all this. And then we'll have three speakers. The first two are here in the room with us. And then Dr. Julia Haggerty and Dr. Betsy Taylor. Um, after their presentations, we'll take a short break and then we'll have a presentation. We'll reconvene for a presentation by Dr. Delson Mulvaney, who will be speaking to us at three o'clock Eastern time from San Jose, California. Um, after each presentation, we'll have a few moments for questions and answers, and then we'll have a longer session for discussion at the end of the afternoon, and we plan to end the whole open session by 4.30, so that's the overall picture. I'd like to begin with some introductions, and we'll, we'll start with the people in the room, and I ask you to, when you do speak, just hit the go button on your microphone so, so that people offline, uh, online <laughs> can hear you. Um, and what do we need to know? Uh, name, institution, that's probably good enough. Um, so I'm Carol Harden. I'm a professor emerita of the University of Tennessee, although I now reside in the state of Vermont. My name is Jacqueline Vajunik. I'm a program officer for um, geography and spatial sciences at NSF. <laughs> okay, I didn't, I was pushing the sign that says push to talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm Betsy Taylor. I'm executive director of the Livelihoods Knowledge Exchange Network. I'm Julia Haggerty. I'm at Montana State University. I'm Nancy Jackson. I'm at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Budu Hadri, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Carly Brody with the National Academies. Elizabeth Ada with the National Academies. Uh, Bill Selecki, City, Un City University of New York, Hunter College. Yeah. I'm Marilyn Brown. I'm a Regents Professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Glenn McDonald from UCLA. Deb Glick from National Academies. And then we have we have just a few people with us online today. I wonder if we could ask you to just say your name and if you're affiliated with an institution or the place where you are at the moment. My name is Ben Cross. I'm with Ohio I think we have a few others. Um, hi, my name is Kristen Smith. I'm at Montana State University. Katie oh, so Bill Walsh is on. She's a graduate student at Montana State University. Okay. Well, welcome to everybody. Um, whether or not you were able to introduce yourself, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, I'd like to give you just a little bit of context for this meeting. The mission of our Geographical Sciences Committee, which is a standing committee here at the National Academies, our mission is to serve the nation. And one way we do this is to convene meetings, meetings such as this one on topics that we think are really important to the country's future. One of the purposes of this meeting is to educate ourselves, but beyond that, what we really want to do here today is to consider what is and what is not well understood about the effects of the current energy transition on opportunities for rural America. We see this topic as being inherently geographic as well as interdisciplinary. And in the past few years, 
our committee has spent a lot of time considering questions that primarily relate to urban areas. So we really wanted to turn our attention to rural America. Plus, we understand that our cities wouldn't exist without the rest of the country. We need food, fiber, fuel, water, ecosystem services, raw materials. I mean, we basically need all of our rural America and we need to um, make sure that the opportunities are there for rural America. We see an energy transition at play. We see a real move toward solar and wind power, toward battery storage, and in many places really becoming a reality. And we expect this transformation to become even more dramatic in the next decade. For one thing, the economics of the energy transition Um, the economics of it are changing and the cost of renewable energy is really on the decline. And this goes, this isn't political. Sometimes we, we worry about political differences between um, rural and um, urban places. But as you can see in this map that has red state, red parts of states and blue parts of states, the blue ones are um, congressional districts held by the Democrats in the 116th, the current Congress, and the red, of course, are Republicans. And these are all districts with online wind projects and wind-related manu manufacturing facilities. So we're not only seeing this move toward wind energy in places that we might think of as very progressively politically blue, we're seeing this um, change, this transition going on really across the country. Some of the predicted changes are really quite dramatic. And to use coal as an example, just last week, an online writer for Forbes noted that six years from now, most coal plants in the United States are expected to cost more to operate than the cost of building replacement solar and wind within 35 miles of the plant itself. And so the map that shows up here actually toggles back and forth between 2018 and 2025. But the, the real picture is that the reds are um, more than 25% less cost for renewables. And then of course it grades into the blues and the, and the dark. So you can see that th there's a definite geography to this and it isn't every place in the country where renewables are gonna be costing a lot less according to this projection, but there is a very definite geography to it. So we're seeing the energy transition happening. Um, and there are a lot of drivers for that. Certainly we're worried about public health and we're worried about the fact that our energy choices have just tremendous consequences for the whole earth planetary system. The, um, this is the last map that I have to show you. And this is a map from the climate communication group at Yale that is the result of a survey of the estimated percentage of adults who think that global warming is happening. And as you can see, we're now at a point where pretty much more than half the population across the country is seeing, is, is ready to say, yes, we think that we think this is happening. And so this is, of course, one of the drivers for the energy transition also. Now, to guide our discussion today, the committee, as we thought about this, posed a set of four questions. And I'm going to put these up now, and maybe we'll refer back to these later. The first one is just, what types of changes related to the energy transition have already been observed in rural areas? Where are we now? What are we seeing? The second question is, what are the ripple effects of these changes to rural communities and states? And then, this is really the big question for us, the open-ended one. Uh, what new opportunities in rural areas are expected to be associated with this transition. So what is the future, what, what could the future hold in the, name, in, in the realm of opportunity? And then because we're geographers, we've asked what new geographic patterns, for instance, economic activity, human migration, environmental costs and benefits are emerging or are expected to emerge as a result of the energy transition. So with those, 
I, I think I've given you enough background that we should just jump right in to our um, hearing from our speakers today. Our first speaker will be Dr. Julia Haggerty. She's a member of the Department of Earth Sciences at Montana State University, and she also has a faculty appointment in the Montana Institute on Ecosystems. She leads work on problems of community resilience, energy impacts, and rural land use change. And she currently directs a multi-institutional research project called Escaping the Resource Curse, which is funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In addition, she co-directs energyimpacts.org, which is an NSF-funded research coordination network focused on social science research on energy development. She holds a BA from Colorado College and a PhD, not in geography, but in history, from the University of Colorado at Boulder. She was a postdoc at the Center for the Study of Agriculture and the Environment at the University of Otago for two years. For, I guess we're all geographers, we all know that Otago is in New Zealand. Um, and then for the following five years, worked as a policy analyst for the regional nonprofit research group Headwaters Economics, based in Bozeman, Montana. She is a member of the American Association of Geographers, the AAG, and she has served as secretary of the AAG's Environment and Energy Specialty Group and as a member of the Board of Directors for the Rural Geography Specialty Group. This year, she received, she received the Professional Geographer Award from the Energy and Environment Specialty Group. Congratulations, Julie. She's no stranger to the academies either, and since 2015, she served as a member of the Roundtable on Unconventional Oil and Gas here. The title of her presentation is Energy Transitions in, oh, it changed, The Third West in Transition. The big picture on small places. So please help me welcome Dr. Haggerty. Are we testing? Happy? Yes, thank you. Do you want to squeak? Yeah. Okay. Um, so good afternoon and greetings from the Rockies. It was 20 degrees when I woke up yesterday, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here, but it's also an honor, so thank you so much for the invitation. The, oh, and before I get into my prepared comments, I will note one thing that Dr. Hardin didn't observe, which is in the mandate for this um, committee discussion, it did include transitions associated with unconventional hydrocarbon production, um, so don't be surprised when you hear about that in my talk. <laughs> So the energy transition isn't exclusively a rural phenomenon, uh, but it has outsized effects in rural areas. And what I've done is organize my comments to focus on three issues that have emerged as priorities for geographic research and scholarship. And this is just based on my experience as a resource geographer working in the American West. And these three issues are first, understanding the feedbacks and linkages between agricultural and energy system change coordinating research in energy landscapes to improve its intellectual merit and to improve broader impacts of that work. And finally, addressing the gap in transition planning in rural America, including doing what I call getting real about legacy issues. So to make case for these priorities, um, I wanna first provide just a quick primer on the economic geography of the rural West. And then I'll turn to research, recent and ongoing research um, in both oil and gas and coal communities. So this is necessarily kind of headlines and highlights, and I brought a lot of B slides in case we want to follow up in Q&A. So starting with economic geography. Energy transition, as you know, is playing out in a highly uneven economic landscape with opportunities increasingly concentrated in just a few urban areas in this country. So this is a post-industrial economy that has significant challenges for isolated remote areas. I call these places the Third West, which is an adaptation of the economist Ray Rasker's Three West concept that asks us to think, rethink what it means to be rural. So rather than being a function of population density, the Three West concept emphasizes access to markets, including via airports. 
So the three Wests really are three categories of Western counties that perform differently um, in terms of social and economic metrics. There are the metropolitan counties where the majority of economic activity happens, counties that are connected to them through transportation networks, which include airports. Um, and then finally, this third category of isolated counties. So geographers will know that this third area constitutes a formal economic region and also overlaps with our academic and popular notions of the rural West. It's characterized by open spaces, landscapes of extraction and production, has very low population densities, and this data visualization from Headwaters Economics shows the third West counties in gray um, and shows that compared to metro and connected counties, these remote counties are less able to capture high wage service jobs, have lower average earnings per job, and greater income volatility. Demographically, the region suffers from outmigration, an aging population, and typically lower levels of educational attainment. I'm looking at Deb and Carly. Are we, okay. Um, so the social and economic effects of being isolated from growing economic sectors are compounded by ongoing trends of mechanization in the primary sectors and the effects of long-time dependence on volatile commodity markets. Another important characteristic of this region is what the rural sociologist Carl Krenzel called the social cost of space. The social cost of space describes the confounding effects of distance and low population density on the cost of providing social and governmental services. From doctors to snowplows, there's simply more time and distance involved in providing services and fewer people to bear the cost. In the Third West and other rural parts of America, research documents four times fewer adults for every formal volunteer role than in urban and suburban areas. There's not fewer nonprofits doing the work of uh, providing services. There's just fewer people to staff those positions. Outdated fiscal policy also tends to define these geographies. Tax and expenditure limits adopted during the tax revolt at both the state and the local level mean that counties often can't grow themselves out of a fiscal crisis. And that decades after extracting valuable natural resources or generating electricity for remote cities, they have little to no public funds on hand to assist with transition. So all these factors are important when we think about community capacity to respond to economic and environmental change. And there are other changes um, on the table as well. The impacts of climate change are one, but industrial development is also changing. Where traditional industrial development asked rural people to live and work with extraction or industrial production in exchange for decent wages and long-term employment, today's industrial projects tend to promise fewer local jobs for a shorter amount of time, suggesting that the value proposition for these projects is largely about public revenue, which as I suggested, rural counties often have a really difficult time capturing. So let me shift now to some research highlights, starting with energy and agriculture. So Kristen Smith, who's on the phone, uh, provided this picture from her dissertation research. When farming um, dominates the rural landscape, new energy development is gonna run into existing agricultural land use. So as in the case of these five semi-trucks that are hauling water to a frack job uh, near this North Dakota wheat farm. This expanding energy agriculture overlay has prompted important research about resource competition in these sectors, about environmental outcomes, as well as work into how agricultural operators and communities experience and perceive energy development. In this study of land use effects of oil and gas development, we asked estimated loss provisioning ecosystem services in the Great Plains across North America as a function of new oil and gas wells that were constructed between 2000 and 2012. The results document a loss to energy sprawl of the equivalent of 5 million animal unit, unit months of forage or 120 million bushel, bushels of wheat. We know that ongoing work by geoscientists is continuing to refine how we understand energy and water conflicts. And together, these kinds of studies tend to depict fossil fuel and energy development as at odds, 
However, in our work in Western oil and gas landscapes, we find a more complicated picture. Landowners more commonly describe unconventional oil and gas less as a zero-sum game and more as a balancing act. And this is even the case for landowners who don't stand to directly benefit personally from energy development. Our research is finding that in addition to the value that rural stakeholders put on broader benefits to their communities, at both the farm and the regional scale, they see the oil and gas boom as an opportunity to expand hard infrastructure that they understand to be critical to their long-term economic viability, especially roads and water delivery systems. This massive expansion of infrastructure, which is typically overlooked in approaches to the energy agriculture nexus, presents real questions about whether an already marginal land use system, we're talking about farming in the arid west, is made more resilient or more rigid, both in socioeconomic and social ecological terms. So this I submit is a critical area for future research and just as a plug for qualitative research, uh, both of these dissertation projects that you see here um, have revealed this new area through slow, careful, qualitative research. Our research on planning efforts by oil and gas communities uh, documents a surge of organizing and innovation in these places. Local groups share information, they plan impact mitigation, they otherwise respond to the impact of an energy boom. These are all trends that demonstrate a huge amount of rural community resilience. But at the same time, their efforts tend to be reactive. They're spending a huge amount of social capital and energy on filling a regulatory gap that exists with respect to impact assessment and mitigation. And all these activities are a reminder that in our world of developed governance, industrial development exploits a vast amount of uncompensated volunteer labor. So these are ad hoc governance efforts um, to address energy impacts that aren't a substitute for robust impact assessment or planning. And they especially fall short when it comes to addressing legacy concerns. The challenges of local planning become even more evident when we switch to thinking about the coal transition. So here you see Coal Strip, which is a mine mouth uh, power plant built in a remote spot in eastern Montana. It went online in the 1980s. And it was built to deliver electricity to Seattle and Portland, which if you're not familiar with the geography, right, is hundreds of miles away. Um, and those markets are now seeking to actively decarbonize their electricity mix. But that's not actually why these two older units um, of Coal Strip's four generating units will schedule, will close in three years. These units are closing to resolve a lawsuit about non-compliance with the mercury and air toxic standards. Uh, and the future of these other two stacks um, is very much in question right now. So coal strips situation embodies many of the complexities of the coal transition in the West. This is a facility just at the generating scale that has multiple plant owners who are in multiple jurisdictions subject to a diverse set of accountability structures with respect to decommissioning. The mine company recently declared bankruptcy, uh, and so now the mine is being held by a holding company. And together, these ownership dynamics create an overlapping but disintegrated decision-making space about decommissioning and re reclamation. And these are spaces that rural communities are typically poorly prepared to negotiate. Coal Strip is a relatively empowered company town. It has unionized workers at the mine and at the plant. It's surrounded by relatively disempowered Native American nations who are nonetheless greatly influenced by developments in the coal economy. And as you can see here, there's a vast existing infrastructure. Uh, there is, in addition to the plants and the mine, a water pipeline that brings water from the Yellowstone River uh, hundreds of miles away, and transmission lines that have been built, uh, railroad, a railroad leg, in a pretty significant existing environmental legacy, so we have a leaking coal ash pond problem here, as well as real questions about what the future looks like. So we're studying how local and state um, entities are responding to the coal transition in the West, and I wanna share a little bit about that. But first I wanna just think about the coal transition as a geographic phenomenon at the national scale. So as you know, 
the dissolution of the U.S. generating fleet, coal generating fleet is happening, it's accelerating. Here we show uh, what we think is the most up-to-date up timeline um, of coal generating capacity going out into the future. So here we show green, these are all coal additions over time. In gray, we show retirements. Um, here we are in the present, and this is what we know is happening in the future. And I just want to remind the committee that this is not wholly what we would call a clean energy transition. So we add in this chart natural gas additions in bright blue. That's a lot of natural gas capacity that we've added, um, and it raises some pretty serious questions about path dependency in our electricity system. But let's think about this as a spatial issue um, and as a problem for planning. The coal transition clearly affects both mines and plants. But we haven't had a research or a policy space that really connects those developments in an effective way to date. So we're just starting to do this, and we're doing it in collaboration with colleagues at Headwaters Economics and the University of Wyoming. And what we find when we aggregate these data sets, um, and it's a pretty complicated set of data connections we have to make, is that uh, while every nine in 10 megawatts of power that's scheduled to retire at a power plant, um, is in a metropolitan or connected place. Seven in every 10 tons of coal that's at jeopardy from these plant closures is in a remote and rural place. So that's actually not that surprising if you know that 40% of the nation's coal is mined in a single county in Wyoming. But we're, all, we're really interested in this as a planning problem. So we've asked about the places where plant and mine closures coincide to make this really complex set of planning challenges. So here we map a very early assessment um, of the complexity of the closure or the decommissioning planning space. So every dot you see here is a county that hosts a mine or a power plant or both. Those that are at risk of losing both a generating station and a mine are shown in red. And those that show um, a risk of losing either a mine or a plant, even in partial amounts, are shown in yellow. And green dots are what we call safe for now. So in the western portion of the map, you can see that the third west and the energy transition really begin to line up. We consider this as a planning and cumulative impact assessment challenges, and as I said, are interested in governance responses. In this paper, we synthesize literature from community resilience, economic geography, and planning scholarship to create a framework for ass assessing transition planning, and then we apply that to 10 ongoing plant closures in the west. What we learned from this work is that in rural geographies, anticipating the loss of a plant, planning for transition ranges from non-existent to fairly inadequate. The closure of two of coal strips generating units, for example, has produced two planning documents, one by the coal industry that focuses on rolling back regulation, and another by the local economic development coalition that focuses on attracting replacement heavy industries, such as tire burning facilities. So coal strips existing plans, like the majority of emerging planning processes, really struggle to address the four elements that we see as critical to robust transition planning. You need to have a plan to replace lost revenue. You need to plan for environmental reclamation and try to build that into local economic opportunities. Planning needs to be realistic about economic geography and what opportunities really exist. Um, and it's important for planning processes to reflect uh, an outlook that is forward-looking rather than backward-looking. So thinking about this kind of planning problem, it's easy to blame, blame the lack of a mandate um, and the loss of federal assistance for transition planning. But the reality, I would argue, is that there's really a series of conditions that converge to produce what I call the transition planning policy gap. So this diagram suggests that um, this policy gap and planning gap occurs when local limits on capacity meet a set of exogenous barriers to transition planning. And the result is in the middle a community that really has no way to chart its uh, course forward. And I use this diagram also to make some suggestions for what we as geographers might consider doing. So first, I would encourage us to think about the ways we can respond to the local factors that are shown here on the left. Despite high levels of social capital and community resilience, resource-dependent communities often suffer from a lack of planning capacity. 
a tendency toward what my favorite environmental sociologist, Bill Friedberg, would call addictive economic decisions and hugely overtaxed social systems. So here's an excellent opportunity for service learning at local universities and colleges, as well as professional training programs to support participatory planning, impact modeling and assessment, and to fill community capacity gaps. As the case of the diverse stakeholder landscape of Coal Strip illustrates, support for local planning also has to be integrated at the regional scale. So geographers, um, I would argue, really need to work to think about what the most creative and effective forms that regional coordination in impact assessment and mitigation might take. As a quick detour, I'll note that there's a risk that uncoordinated research creates unwanted costs in communities and actually skews our research findings. So we have a USDA funded inquiry into the topic of research fatigue in energy communities. Um, and it's produced a, a meta-analysis of all of the shale research that has been conducted between 2000 and 2018. And all the times that uh, social scientists have gone out to collect data in energy communities. And <clears throat> there appears to be a correlation between the number of universities in an area um, and the amount of research that goes on. So we're lucky that the National Science Foundation supports our energy impact uh, research coordination network. But going back to coal and making the case for regional coordination, this is something we've done before. We've done rapid and serious engaged research at regional scale before. The coal infrastructure, which you can see on this map in the left, in the west, is for the most part relatively new. Um, and it was built in a moment of unprecedented coordination. So the scope of the 1971 North Central Power Study, hundreds of coal mines uh, and power plants across the Northern Great Plains and Pacific Northwest galvanized armies of scholars and researchers to study potential impacts. So many of my senior colleagues at Montana State were active in those assessments. The data they produced were important to policymakers, especially the Western governors who collaborated to insist that the new coal infrastructure came with a social contract about its long-term impact. And if you're familiar with SMACRA, we really have SMACRA because of this level of coordination. I think it goes without saying that this social contract is one that's largely been abandoned at this point in time. Indeed, anyone who digs into local coal transition planning finds they face an enormously complex set of external forces shown here on the right. So these involve not only the national political atmosphere, which you can see down here, um, but also importantly, the private corporations and the regulatory environment in which they operate. Coal mining companies are in the midst of a cycle of bankruptcy proceedings that allow organizations like Arch Coal or Peabody to shed debt in the order of billions of dollars. And the influence of corporate structure and corporate regulation on how social impacts and long-term environmental challenges um, and legacy risk is addressed is a vital research gap. So I submit here is the work um, for an upcoming generation of critical resource geographers. So to summarize, I advocate for a few priorities for geographic scholarship. This is not to the exclusion of many other important trajectories, but just what I know from my own experience. So these priorities are continuing to consider the feedback between agriculture and energy, coordinating research and doing better engagement, and jumping into the transition planning policy gap. So thanks for your attention so far. I'm very grateful to the collaborators and funders that make this work possible. I'm happy to take any questions and dig into details that you might find interesting now. Who has a question? Well, I'll begin. Um, you showed us a, a pretty dramatic view of this coal plant that is um, in transition of some sort, and it looked like there was a community uh, mm -hmm. Right, right, adjacent to it. So, what what is your guess? If the whole place were to shut down, what is your guess of what would happen to that community? Would 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 it completely die? Would everybody go somewhere else? Well, let's just remember that. So here's Coal Strip. It was a planned community. Um, 
They have won some awards for the uh, community planning that was implemented in this community. Uh, I want to just remind you that it is in a landscape of Indigenous nations of people who are not going anywhere. Um, what I've heard from people that I um, know in Coal Strip is that many of the um, mine and plant workers who are near retirement age will um, either stay and retire in the community or um, likely are in a position to, to migrate out. Uh, I think this is a place where one of the things we consider in our transition policy analysis is whether it's sort of um, planning for population shrinkage is an important plan planning enterprise. Um, so what happens to this community in the long term? It's really hard to say. I would expect significant out migration, but there is this huge infrastructure um, that is built in this place. Uh, while we're on that slide, <clears throat> slide, um, I, yeah. Well, while, while we're on that slide, Julia, uh, what kind of scrubbers are on that uh, facility, and to what extent has that local community been subject to um, you know, deleterious um, air pollution? So I'm not an expert in the technology of scrubbers, um, but I will say that there's an interesting story here, which is that the Northern Cheyenne uh, Reservation when Coal Strip was being proposed at this moment of great coordination, um, was very opposed to the, uh, the construction of this power plant. This is in the um, late 1970s. And so insisted on, particularly in the second two stacks, what were then the sort of state-of-the-art scrubbers with respect to removing um, but we still sulfur dioxide. Yeah. But these two older stacks um, aren't compliant and it's not cost effective to retrofit them for mercury and air toxics. Um, the, the big environmental issue that most people are paying attention to is that there has been um, significant seepage of these ash ponds to the extent that many of the domestic wells in this town are threatened. Um, and it's a difficult topic to study because as part of the legal settlement, all of the homeowners are um, bound by non-disclosure agreements. Uh, and we're just in the process in the state of just now finalizing and approving the plans for addressing that um, coal seepage issue. But that local air pollution is not an issue that has been on the radar right now. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the pollution is coming from uh, i just looking at that photograph. I'm astounded that that planned community was put so close to four large uh, coal burning plant units. Oh. Uh, yeah, um, a very, very uh, interesting talk. Uh, just a quick question about, you know, about that community. One of the things I've been been looking at, and some people, um, some of my students have been asking similar questions about sort of legacies of sort of past change, right? And so how much of that remains? Um, and, you know, I'm by no means an expert on the question, but, uh, you know, in other rural areas I'm more familiar with, this, it's always been at some level, there's been cycles of boom and bust, right? And you kind of highlighted some of those exogenous factors. So I guess the question, you know, um, given the stresses facing these types of communities, you know, is there kind of a legacy, like maybe, maybe a real simple level, who are those folks? And but more importantly, uh, you know, what's the legacy of boom and bust? And how are they sort of interpreting what's going on? You know, as part is that part of a, a series of, of boom and bust processes that they, you know, maybe their uh, grandparents or parents experienced and, and how are they sort of thinking about is there opportunities for, you know, we're talking about transitions. Are they thinking about like, you know, uh, Carol mentioned relocation, but are they also thinking about reimagining, you know, what the town could be? I guess is you know, a lot of little pieces of that right. question, um, but I apologize so for that. Thanks for that question. I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about this in Betsy's talk. Um, so I would make two distinctions. The, the coal, many of these um, coal towns in the West, it, particularly in the Powder River Basin, were constructed in the 70s. So we're not really talking about multiple generations of um, that experience. Oil and gas communities, on the other hand, and then and since that time, uh, for the most part, coal production was really quite steady until very recently. So I wouldn't think of those places. Coal Strip was it's complicated. Coal Strip was um, a coal export community during before the railroads switched to diesel, but there are not many people in Coal Strip that you know were present from the 1950s when the dieselization affected the railroads until the power plants were built. So most of these people who are living there now came during um, the 70s and 80s and more recently. 
But oil and gas communities um, show real sensitivity to boom and bust cycles. One of the things they tend to be is very fiscally conservative in response to that. Um, and they, they face kind of like an impossible conundrum uh, when it comes to making investments in local infrastructure and thinking about how to move forward. But we, have, we do know some really interesting examples um, of communities, like I said, who are trying to use moments of windfall um, to make investments that they think will benefit them in the long term, but they face a pretty challenging circumstance with respect to doing that. I don't know if I answered your you question. No, you didn't. A quick Please. follow up. I mean, are these communities, I mean, you, you gave a great national picture as well about, I mean, is there any kind of connectivity between these communities? That's a great question. So, I, I, as I said, I'm a huge advocate for doing regional coordination. It's just building in the West. Um, so, we've worked with the Just Transition Fund. Um, and they're really interested in thinking about how to tackle this problem in the West because you can see that it's like a really spread out landscape and it doesn't necessarily have the kind of close regional identity that you might see um, in Appalachia. But nonetheless, there are some efforts to bring people together um, in the National Association of Counties is trying to do some organizing to support whole communities. I think it's an open question kind of what's going to work best. But I will say that um, the idea that we don't have regional coordination in the Powder River Basin, where 40% of our coal comes from, much of which is at risk, um, that's, that's a real problem. So one of the uh, transition opportunities that TVA has taken advantage of is the conversion of coal plants to um, solar farms serving server farms, you know, so helping to bring better um, better fiber optics into rural areas at the same time, giving some hope of additional employment. There's never as many jobs as the coal plant offered, but we saw uh, introduced introduced by Carol before your talk a, um, a statistic that indicated that we, I think you showed that we now have, are facing a situation where it's cheaper to replace a coal plant that's already operating with, in many cases, with solar. Um, so I assume that there is some discussion along these lines to try to do the uh, break-even analysis. How, how many years would it take to break even with that investment? And have you been privy to any of those results? So what what you'll just want to remember, it's two things I would say about that. So here's coal strip out here. Um, it has five different utilities that would be doing those IRP evaluations to think about what kinds of investments they want to make in infrastructure. Certainly, there is a lot of beneficial transmission access that opens up. Um, so, if you, this hasn't happened in Oregon and Washington yet, but as you know, California now requires all of their, um, their renewable generation to be generated within the state um, as part of new proceedings. So, there's a real question about what the market is for remote sort of um, renewable assets. And you'll hear from Justin, like questions about whether or not that really even makes sense. But then I would say as a person who's interested in economic geography, um, these places don't generate revenue and they don't generate jobs. So uh, that the sort of, they can generate revenue for individual landowners, um, but typically they are not a solution for a place like Coal Strip in terms of um, helping that economy stay whole. And one last point I would make about that is that um, in addition to the broken fiscal policy that we have, in the case of renewables, it gets worse because most states offer big tax incentives associated with renewables. So in Montana, um, it's basically a penny on a dollar. If you're a rural community that's going to have renewable resources in terms of revenue versus a community that's going to have fossil fuel resources. So a state level policy that has real implications for your tolerance and interest in hosting these facilities um, is a big issue. And then just this question that I heard most compellingly by a just transition advocate who just asked, you know, to what extent is ownership in the solar industry any different than ownership in the coal industry? And how can we um, make sure that we keep this kind of question of being colonized at the top of our mind when we make decisions about the energy transition. Elizabeth has been patiently waiting. One last, uh, one last question. Yeah. Julie, I wondered if you could speak toward, um, we know in North Dakota um, from some colleagues who, who work there that they have, have uh, tried to take the approach of 
of putting away funds for this future rainy day. Um, and uh, to some degree, I think they've, they've been successful in at least putting some of the money away. And it's probably too early to tell because they haven't come to that stage where the industry is actually on decline. I wonder if you could comment on anything that you've seen or, or the research that you've done that that indicates that that model could be successful in kind of mitigating, uh, softening this boom bust situation, or if or if there's so many factors at play that that the, this pot of money waiting there is not going to you know not going to be the panacea. Uh, if you could comment on that, if we know anything now that could make us more wise. So you, you definitely want to have a legacy fund, right? You want to be Norway, not uh, West Virginia. <laughs> um, but here's just a philosophical way I think about it. So there's kind of two issues, right? One is this idea that the revenues that you, the public revenues that you generate from natural resource extraction partly reflect the reason we call it severance, right? Is, is taking a non-renewable resource and turning it into capital. Um, and so that non-renewable resource is now gone and no longer a source of potential economic development in the state. So that capital to the degree that you hold some of it back as public revenue should be about long-term investment. It should not be about covering the costs of developing that in the first place. And so that's a real problem with using public revenue to plan for future uh, legacy remediation. So you understand what I'm saying? So I think um, North Dakota has made some really positive moves compared to other states um, and that legacy fund to the extent that they create a governance structure for administering it that is free from kind of corruption, which is sometimes a problem in these state things, um, is a really positive sign. But I don't think it's a solution to questions about legacy issues. Well, thank you so much. And uh, let's thank Julia Hegarty one more time. We'll move on now, but we do have another chance later in the afternoon if you have any further questions for her or ideas that come from that. Our next speaker will be Dr. Betsy Taylor. She's a cultural anthropologist who has worked for community-driven development in Appalachia. I have a problem of, I grew up in a place where we say Appalachia. I lived for 30 years where we say Appalachia, and now I live in Vermont where we say Appalachia again. What do you say, Betsy? Oh, Appalachia, because you're in Kentucky. Yeah, well, and that, that's where the activists Right, okay. Anyway, she is the executive director and founding director of LICAN, which stands for Livelihoods Knowledge Exchange Network. It's a link tank based in Lexington, Kentucky, that was developed to fill gaps in the planning resources of underserved communities, and particularly to build support systems for community-based assessments of risks and assets. She has an academic history, too, having worked at the University of Kentucky and at Virginia Tech. In the early 2000s, she was an adjunct faculty member in the Department of Anthropology and a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Kentucky. And at Kentucky, she also served as research director and faculty co-research director of the Appalachian Center and as co-director of the Environmental Studies Program. They got a lot out of you when you were there. <laughs> at Virginia Tech, she was a research faculty member in the Appalachian Studies Program. Among her publications is the 2010 book co authored with Herbert Reed called Recovering the Commons, Democracy, Place, and Global Justice. That was the University of Illinois Press. She's a nationally recognized researcher. In 2013, she was appointed to the steering committee of the U.S. Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative by the Secretary of the Department of Interior. And she recently chaired the Human Rights Social Justice Committee of the Society for Applied Anthropology. Also, she served as the Vice President of the Political Ecology Society. She holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Mission, Michigan, and earlier on, some years ago, held a Watson Fellowship that allowed her to gather data in Japan, the Philippines, and Nepal on the impact of ecological change on ethical notions regarding, quote, nature. <laughs> I love that part of your CV. Uh, her title today is Energy Transitions and the First West, the Complex Histories of Appalachia's Emerging Futures. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's just such a pleasure to be here. And already in this time, I've, I've learned so much. Um, it's, 
there, there are many, many resonances. So uh, one of our tasks was to talk about transitions, energy transitions that are already underway. And so I have a photo of just about one of the few energy transitions that has actually happened in, in um, central Appalachia, where there's uh, been very little uptake of, of um, renewable energy. This, it, you, you see before you the solar array on the roof of the Kentucky Coal Museum in Benham in Harlan County, Kentucky, which is a very historic uh, um, coal camp that's been there oh, since the early uh, 19th, 20th century. Um, and this embodies the key theme of my talk, which is that the emergent new energy realities very much are growing out of the very complex systemic patterns of the past. And um, I, it, it's been extremely helpful to um, already to think about, to have an interregional conversation. Um, when I was Preparing for this, I reread an article by Eleanor Ostrom about avoiding panaceas. And I found it very helpful for trying to think about what our intellectual tasks are right now. And her goal in that article was to say, we have to think very seriously about what the um, broad intellectual tasks are of doing actionable policy relevant science for um, to manage uh, complex adaptive systems. And her point is that we have, I, I really like this phrase of hers, our habits as scholars and as officials are to decompose a complex adaptive system into manageable units where you can delimit the causal factors um, that you, you need to think about in order to look clearly at causal interactions or if you were developing a, a, a government program or any kind of program, you need to have an efficient way to assess impact. So you need to, to clearly see cause and effect. Her point is that if we do that, decompose reality in that way, then we will actually be promulgating policy panaceas, which are limited solutions, which do, do almost inherently cannot scale and respond to the, to the multi-layered scale jumping path dependent realities of complex adaptive systems. And her argument is very similar to what Julia has just so wonderfully laid out, which is we have to, we can't think of one person doing this or one unit. We really need to think about ways to create what she calls diagnostic frameworks for much larger multiplicit, multiplicitous intellectual endeavors that bring together many kinds of, of, of players in, in that conversation. So um, in thinking about this, my, the way I picture this situation is that we're talking, uh, when we're talking about energy systems, um, let's say the coal energy system, it's like looking at a, a, a three-dimensional chess game where in many ways you have the same players appearing. And so while Julie was talking, I kept getting the shock of recognition. Oh, there's the queen, there's the rook, you know, but they're on different boards because of the way in which nested uh, subsystems essentially take on these very path dependent and various um, um, causalities. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to go very broad because as we are developing is, through like in this the, the link tank um, that I'm, I'm working with now and our wide webs of partnerships, uh, we also are creating these sort of big projects where we're looking for what I think is, can be well described as diagnostic frameworks that can encompass um, multiplicities. And I'm finding that in almost all of the projects that we're doing now, we, uh, we're bringing together community people, scholars, officials, um, various players, artists, very excitingly, and one of the first things we do is something that we're calling naming. 
just using exercises to identifying what we're talking about, what causal factors are at stake. And then the next part we, we call framing, and this is language that partly comes from the Kettering Foundation. And, and then the final stage is alignment, where we, through various kinds of participatory exercises, sort of do this kind of ontological clarification, look at our differences, and then, and then bring them into alignment. So I'm going to start by looking, naming the ecology that we're facing and, and the factors naming social and cultural assets that are potentially important, and then starting to couple them together with some particular tangles of, of wicked problems, and finally try to focus on a couple key sort of sensitive intervention points, as some people are saying. Um, so so the, it, my, my presentation is going to be very broad, not deep. Um, I'm primarily focusing on what Appala the Appalachian Regional Commission calls North Central, Central, and South Central Appalachia, which I will call Central Appalachia, and at coal impacted areas, um, partly because there are profound changes underway, and there, there are many different realities that are contradictory and emergent possibilities that could be quite astonishing. So let's start with looking at, at, the, at, at this region as uh, ecologically, and um, I, tangled together in this slide are two very different things. One is the cultural framework that the nation has put on Appalachia as the point of extraction. And um, simultaneously, you can also look at Appalachia as this really remarkable region ecologically that has particular significance in the 21st century in an era of climate change. And what I would propose is that with all the stereotyping of Appalachia and the portrayal of it as a problem region, when you work with local people to do asset-based sort of cultural reimagining and bring them together with ecologists, you find flickering there a very different ecological, a very different regional identity. And so um, it, it's, we, there is a desperate need for scholarly support in documenting um, the, the, these alternatives. If you look at the climate stressors that we face, uh, water scarcity, extreme weather events, of course the need to sequester carbon, the, the dangers of climate migration, both human and non-human, and the need to phase out uh, long supply chains. Um, Appalachia has remarkable assets to provide. Um, it's, if, it's the water tower for the country. Think about what our, our cent the century would be without the, um, those mountains stopping the, the, the moisture. It, we, it, we, and in this presentation, I've tried to identify areas where we really need scholarly support and clarification. The capacity for, uh, for uh, the, the forests and the soils of Appalachia to function as carbon sinks is very unclear, and many of the studies are not engaging the variegated terrain. This would be an ideal citizen science project if we could find a sort of broad collaboration. And then if this area does provide these kinds of services. Are there new kinds of policy frameworks um, that could be tied to the, um, um, th this is a national service that Appalachia is providing by, by, by being a carbon sink. Now, there are many dangers here, but, th but this is part of um, the potential sort of emerging identity. Um, the other thing is that climate change is already affecting American agriculture. In that pattern, what kind of new um, agroforestry niches might appear as supply chains shorten? And um, could Appalachia of the 21st century become more like Appalachia of the 19th century, which was a food basket in many ways for, for, um, for the U.S. And then finally, the, this, this mountain range uh, with its rumbled terrain is, is, um, is a global resource for uh, climate refugia. And uh, Lucy Braun in uh, the early, um, 
famously described it as the mother forest because during various glaciations, it was where um, both flora and fauna found refuge and, 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 and repopulated uh, North America. So, um, but the, the, the much more research needs to be done. And, and again, this is very variegated research. Um, so I, this is a way in which there, there might, the, connecting some of the climate mitigation with the energy transition in Appalachia is something that I think would be of more interest than many people suspect to communities that are working on just transition. There are stereotypes about sort of Appalachian mindsets. Um, it's, it's not an area that's distinguished for its, its, renewable, its potential for re renewable energy, although possibly wind power and micro hydro. But, um, but but the, the, this there's been because of the regional identification um with with coal and uh, gas it's um the, the, there've only been two surveys of of um of the regional capacity i want to talk now about some of this uh, civic and social a assets in the region and again um this this is a kind of uh, history that is is often not very visible to the outside there's a rich and layered history of of um of uh, social movements from the the labor struggles to the um environmental uh, justice movements um and that have a particular sensibility that combines a kind of working class rural connection to care for the land with economic justice. Um, this photo is comes from Anne Lewis's wonderful film, To Save the Land and People, um, where uh, women played a very important role in, in, in fighting strip mining. And of course, Highlander Center continues to play a very important role started in 1932 as a labor education center. Um, it was a key site for um, the civil rights uh, movement of the 1950s and 60s. Um, and um, from its beginning, uh, it, it was inspired by the uh, Danish um, folk school movement. And so participatory action research and popular education has been really central to that mission and integral to much of the, um, many of the social movements in, in, in the region. And there's rich but variegated um, traditionally ecological knowledge. Um, this is from a wonderful collection by the folklorist Mary Hufford. It's um, called Tending the Commons in uh, documenting um, uh, uh, forest-based livelihoods. So let's talk now about some of the, this, the wicked problems of the um, of the c coupled human and, and, and ecological systems. And um, in, it's been, one of our goals is to try to better integrate some of the new literatures on the resource curse internationally into, which many of which are focused on greenfield development into really looking serious, getting a realistic look at, at the old, um, old, um, um, it, it resource curses in, in, that are often less visible in, in um, uh, America. Um, and these are the factors uh, that just jump out as um, deeply entrenched ruts in the, in, in the path of development in, um, in Appalachia. If you look at public revenues from the east to the west in the U.S., they, they're, they're, they, they, there's been improvement as new development has happened. But what we have in Appalachia, which is core to the situation now, is incredibly badly designed um, public revenue structures. And um, the, so that um, the severance monies that were only really started to be collected in the 70s and 80s um, in significant ways contributed to what I call a kind of fiscal diabetes where you have this sort of flood of, of 
energy coming into a system um, with uh, local governments that are unable to really handle um, um, the resources coming in during the boom periods and then uh, no, no buffering against the, the, the bust. But there's been much too little attention to um, the connection between finance and coal and extraction in general um, in, the, in the 18th and 19th century. So that um, before the you know, 1910s, the Appalachian region in many ways was sort of the Wall Street for the Eastern Seaboard. And land speculation there um, sort of provided the old money for much, much, of the, much of the East. And those structures, um, the, the land holding companies and the layering of um, rights and ownership of land um, are, are inadequately studied. Um, and um, there's a, an extraordinary l lack of transparency in information, both about land and, and revenues, because of the, the kind of federal system we have of a very siloed um, and fragmented um, governance. Um, and increasingly, I feel like we really need to think about this situation of an entrenched resource curse that in some ways is sort of invisible in the larger conversation. I mean, there's been a kind of reinstatement of a sort of cultures of poverty framework here that's blaming the region in some ways for, for, for these problems. I'm wondering about, and again, this would be helpful to, to have some pondering of, about considering this uh, something like an energy debt between the nation and the region um, and thinking through what that might mean because you can make very direct connections between the social impacts over a hundred years um, that are now measurable in, 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 in the region and the, the wealth that, um, of, of, the, of the country now, on, on, a, on a positive side, um, the, 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 the sort of civic labor that Julia was talking about, this incredible uh, sort of ad hoc stepping into the breach of regulatory failure um, is vividly, uh, is, is visible in several moments. Um, in the, in the late 70s, after devastating floods, when in some of these counties, half of the people were homeless, the Highlander Center organized a whole series of, of local community meetings and um, they did what they called root cause analysis, really looking down to the underlying um, problems and people said it's land, land ownership. So that led to one of the first really big participatory action research studies. Um, it was a groundbreaker in citizen science to see who owns Appalachia. Hundreds of people were, went to the county courthouses, got the records, and it was processed by um, uh, folks in local reach, in local universities and found a shocking land inequality. Basically, 25% of the land is available to, to residents, who, uh, local people in, in most of these counties. So this, um, pattern of land inequality is can be still seen in deep inequality local inequality within these counties um, this shows uh, the the ratio of income of the top 20% to the to the bottom 20% which clearly shows a two tier class society and in this situation the power of local elites is is um, is endemic to the system. So it, it's sometimes easy to look at some of these counties and see the governance problem is a problem of corruption, which is there, or a problem of um, cronyism or, or whatever. But the underlying fact is when you have this kind of deep local in, inequality, um, it, it um, you, you get a a situation that is, is very hard to, to assess or measure 
but of disconnection among many people. And there have been some targeted studies of social trust. Shannon Bell has done a lovely piece where she's shown how social tr trust it collapses at waves of conflict, like uh, when with some of the union struggles, um, and you can sort of see that as a layered um, political trauma. Um, but look at voter turnout in the in the 1960s. This region actually had some of the highest voter turnout uh, turnout rates in 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 the country. Um, and then the the kind of uh, underinvestment in in public goods and services like education, coupled with the sticky waves wages phenomenon of people not necessarily feeling the need to go ahead and get education. So you get this strange paradox of too much government and too little government um, with a high dependence in many of these counties on distribution. So p power relations actually are s structured more by control over the downward distribution of government goods than they are by the um, coal mining jobs or something like that. And um, Wayne Coombs has uh, just developed a, a um, he he um, directed um, substance abuse programs in West Virginia for many years, and he's developing this model of he calls um, of uh, analyzing drug um, deaths and uh, abuse as um, as as post as a reaction. Um, and the role of the 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 cumulative effect in a region that has experienced this much mining of SMACRA um, is really remarkable because SMACRA essentially, despite the intent of the law, lacks triggers to connect the agencies responsible for economic development with the agencies responsible for reclamation. Um, and this fragmentation of government is now coming into visibility in really dramatic ways. And I think the next 10, 15 years is going to see some uh, even more shocking things, especially in things like the um, collapse of public water systems that were put in with no long-term planning to mountainous areas that freeze in the winter at high expense and with um, sort of boom and bust waves of public funding for water systems that have to be maintained by counties without expertise. Um, and so in this situation, this sounds like a very dire picture. <laughs> Let me say it's, it's a strange time to be doing the work I do because I, you know, I've, I've Coming, coming here from Kentucky, you know, I, I stopped off at a bunch of different places where we have various projects. There's, there's a feeling of hope afoot. And it feels like this system I just described is fragile. And uh, building off of what Julia was saying, I would like to argue that it's fragile because a lot of the um, Wicked problems came from a particular kind of rigidity in interscalar relationships between local decision making and and higher levels of decision making. And there's a pent up rage, of course, we've seen that in various elections, but also, especially among young people, uh, an openness to really radical kinds of change. And so I feel that if we could develop the kinds of broader frameworks for collaborative research that are cross-sectoral, as Julia is describing, and if we could really refine our methodologies for connecting local participatory research with scholarly tasks that actually support the direction of the problem solving, I think we could see a kind of breakthrough, like, you know, water breaking through the ice, but it requires long-term, stable, robust, horizontal, regional linkages between local projects, intergenerational um, conversations, participatory action research, and 
interagency cooperation, which is probably the hardest. So let me just give you some examples of, of projects that are having an impact. The Highlander Center ever evolving has developed over the last couple of years at Appalachian Economic Transition Fellowship, where uh, these young people spread out across the country and they work for a year with the local grassroots project, but they get together every month. And part of this is an emotional and a cultural process of, of social learning for very intense uh, sharing and community. Um, Central Appalachian Network is, um, is a knowledge sharing network among people that are doing transition projects. Appalachian Voices has just started this good um, a solar strategy to uh, setting up uh, micro demonstration centers, hoping that will sort of spread out. And this is one of my favorites, and I was very involved with this from about 2014, the Alliance for Appalachia, which is primarily an advocacy group. Their role is to connect grassroots works with um, federal policy, um, have developed this method, which I think is a very valuable research method, participatory research method that they call agency mapping. And about half of the participatory action research they do is trying to understand government in all its labyrinthine complexity. And um, there's a great fascination with the AML fund, which is sort of an accident. It's become sort of the equivalent of the sovereign wealth fund. But it, it, by an accident, Congress just didn't keep uh, um, appropriating money. So now there's several billions of dollars. So they decided, well, let's really try to understand this. So two of the Appalachian, um, uh, the Highlander fellows, took that on and we thought, oh, well, we'll figure this out and do, well, this report, which was supposed to be a popular education curriculum to go on the road is 175 pages. That's how complicated this is. It's a wonderful report and it set up relationships with various federal officials because it was such, they did such a good job that they have become quite effectively involved in lobbying for the Reclaim Act, which this morning was just introduced in the, in the House, um, House uh, Committee on Natural Resources, and finally might begin to heal the fl deep flaw of SMACRA, which is it requires that economic plans get connected to the reclamation, and it, it requires uh, participation, citizen pr public participation. Now, that's still very vague, and this is, again, where scholarly input and um, especially students could help. Um, I'm part of a, of a big group, um, mostly centered in the University of Kentucky, but with involvement of regional, many regional colleges and universities and citizens to redo the Appalachian land ownership study, which is a gargantuan task. Um, and we are just doing wonderful local projects, participatory mapping, to capture the intricacies of what people have decided to call the land matrix, which is everything that maintains land equality, including webs of power, money, public revenues, policies, mindsets, and values, which came from one of our um, events, and um, lots of power mapping with um, young people. Here we're doing stakeholder assessment and finding some very surprising pictures in terms of land scenarios at the local level and building solidarity. Again, the emotional uh, aspect of this. Stories of Place project has spun off and it's, uh, it's very much an oral history of, of land, um, but is, we're starting to add a climate dimension to this. So to sum up, all of these projects that give me hope um, are attempting to grapple with the reality of multi-causal complex systems by building cross-scalar and cross-sectoral um, webs of connectivity and trying to do this in a way that makes, um, that, uh, that, that can create enough durability to address the, the time frames within which sol that solutions actually require, which is, you know, you know, it, it requires the kind of investment that Highlander Center has had decades. So it's, uh, thank you so much for this chance to have a sort of uh, conversation between the region and the nation and then other regions.
We have a few minutes for questions and answers, and then at 2.45, we'll take a break so that we can all be ready to go when our remote speaker comes on at 3 o'clock. Um, who has a question? Glenn. Now I can get it on. I want to thank Julia and Betsy for two really excellent talks. And I mean, the, the thoughts that are kind of running through my head now, I really can't control them. But, you know, uh, thinking about your talks and also thinking about some of the geographer Michael Watts' work in, on energy, the oil industry, its impact in Nigeria, for example, you know that putting that all together. So this was sort of what role does energy, maybe alternative energies play in these rural things. And essentially all I've really seen is that energy extraction, in most of these areas have done nothing for those areas because the capital that's accrued from that then goes to other regions. So it built, it built New York, for example, right? And in California, it helped build Los Angeles and, and you know, built Dallas and, and all of that. But it's not doing anything for them. It's a short-term thing. And if you think about it, then they're sort of, well, we'll revitalize coal. Uh, I don't think that would do much in the long run because they don't retain the capital and they don't retain the capacity to build something new from there. And so when I think about this, citing wind or citing solar in these places which uh, I, it was described to me putting solar in the Imperial Valley of California would be giving jobs to people who basically clean windows. So that is cleaning the top of the panel, right? Where that, those facilities are owned by someone someplace else or are owned offshore even, it's not gonna really do much. It's gonna even have less local um, uh, employment and the capital accrued from it is not gonna build a sustainable economy there. So this is, this is really a wicked problem that goes deep beyond where transmission lines are, where we have solar energy and things like this. This is a problem that really asks us to look at basic regulatory structure of, of how capital is generated here. And so I have a million things just running through my mind. I wanna thank you for, for stimulating that, although I'm gonna have a hard time sleeping tonight. Yeah. It, every time I come to an East Coast city, I look around for the timber and the wealth of Appalachia. And at some point, we're not going to get beyond these wicked problems till we have a national conversation about this, because there is a very direct energy debt. One of our projects that we're considering with the stories of place, where we're um, documenting the oral histories of particular places, but along with that, the layers of land ownership. In much of central Appalachia, especially West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky, the land is actually held by land holding companies, which are kind of like heritage artisanal uh, legal entities, you know, it's like particular families and in particular cities. And so we're gonna reach out to those families in a way very similar to with plantations, you know, where enslaved people and plantation owners were brought together. And uh, these are, this is the old money of the East. And say, let's have a conversation. And so one hope is that with the Stories of Place project, we can have artists in Kentucky and poets and photographers document the biodiversity, document the devastation, and then maybe have a traveling art exhibit that brings story and statistics together, and then have that conversation. I, the language of reparations doesn't feel adequate, but maybe if we have a deeper national conversation, other ideas would come. As the energy debt is as close as I can get. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, again, thank you. They're both great talks. Um, I do think there's some commonalities. I know from the Powder River Basin uh, contracts for long-term power um, purchasing to California, which you know ended a while ago when California decided they weren't going to ever even import anything more carbon intensive than natural gas. And now they're not even going to import renewables from outside the state boundaries. So just the vulnerabilities when you're going to 
have a future that's dependent upon these contractual relationships. Um, I love the tracking ownership of land and all of the link linkages and supply chains. I think that's very powerful um, when you get at the REITs, the real estate investment trusts and uh, people who have, I mean, grandchildren who've inherited um, shares and stocks and investments that have no idea what they are, uh, that the impacts of those investments are having. Um, I know that the taxation of property is uh, you know, highly, highly contested um, political hot potato, but that is a that is a lever. And uh, in Georgia, we're always talking about should the um, uh, should acres of forest, you know, be more or less taxed, and depends on what the forests are used for, and a whole debate about that. But you could have a debate in these communities about uh, raising taxes. So have you? Have those debates been uh, carried out about property taxation? I guess it's really for both of you. Yeah. Um, that's yes. People are talking about property taxes quite a bit. Um, it, it's a very like many aspects of natural resource policy. It's a sort of a it's a technical issue. I mean, maybe seems more technical than it actually is, but most of us don't have much fiscal literacy. Um, so when you're talking about small local governments, um, the those who are face a crisis suddenly will begin to understand fiscal policy really well. But that doesn't always translate into political will to change the system. Um, and I could go on and on because fiscal policy is a big part of what we do and how we think about things. But um, yes, it's an important question. Did you want to respond to this? You don't have to. Um, well, I think you have to the, oh, for the last 20 years, these communities have been deeply divided. There's been a new level of bitterness um, that is complicated. And so, um, that's a hard conversation to have. It is appearing, though, in the new pattern of contestation over public services, like the, the teacher strikes. And again, that's where you feel like this system is could shift really quickly. And uh, people are starting to connect the dots between the problems t paying teachers and, and these other issues. Um, yeah. Actually, I had a different question, but you, you, you raised another question in my mind. So West Virginia is always a little bit of an enigma to me. Um, I visited there a few times. It used to be, you know, before even the term blue, but it used to be one of the bluest states. And now it's like, you know, bright, brilliant red, uh, at least in the last in 2016. So like, what was the process, you know, can you describe that sort of, I assume embedded in some of the, the issues you're talking about, and then you just kind of illustrated that there's maybe this possibility is a flip. I don't want to get into politics per se in terms of like, you know, 2020, but like what happened there and how does that, is there any explanation from that to sort of, you know, talk about larger changes? So on the news reports, it looks very red because of those, that's the percentage of people who voted who won? So, but if you if you include the people who voted for no one, and essentially they didn't vote, then it, it's it's not it hasn't it. So we've done a comparison in Kentucky. We haven't done West Virginia, of coal counties to the rest of the state. Eastern Kentucky had such low rates of voting that the people who did vote made the, the state look redder than it is compared to other rural places. And you had these interesting pockets of um, Bernie wipeouts, you know, it was just sort of dramatic, like the equivalent of college towns, that there was something very appealing about Bernie Sanders in, in many of these counties. Now, it, there, there is a lot of appeal to people are angry and disaffected. And so there, there's, you know, 
politicians who communicate that, who communicate that there's something seriously wrong, uh, do have a kind of sway. And, and politics is very bitter. And there's a level of fear that dominates local politics. I would just add that there is a, so when you think about some of the photographs that I showed and just how unpopulated some of the rural areas are, um, there's there's a bit of a vacuum. So when we get this sort of big cultural division between urban and rural areas, what it, what's emerging to fill that space in rural areas is a really loud voice from a pretty um, strident set of politics. And we see that a lot now when uh, local governments have a problem they want to solve. Um, some of the radical right groups are there with networks and resources. This is both through social media, but literally being willing to travel to the county to help them write an ordinance um, that sort of reinforces this kind of fear-based perspective. And that's about a failure, I think, um, on the part of the rest of us to figure out how to engage in those places. Okay, well, that's an interesting way to pause. Um, let's, take a, let's take a short break and let's be back here at three o'clock. I'm going to cut off our break discussion and lead us into the rest of our session. We're going to have a presentation by Dustin Mulvaney, and then we'll have a few minutes for a Q&A just with him. And then we have a further hour after that to continue our discussion. And there's plenty to talk about, I can tell. So um, Dustin, do we have you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. I can hear yeah. everyone loud and clear. Oh. And I even saw, some, Let me... even saw some of the presentations this morning when I was uh, multitasking while in the classroom. So, I, Oh, I great. <laughs> That's morning, your time. Uh, let me do a quick introduction of you and then we'll turn it over to you. So Dr. Dustin Mulvaney is a faculty member in the Environmental Studies Department at San Jose State University. That's in California. And he can't join us today because of a conflict for the student thesis defense, which we thought was, was an acceptable excuse. And we're, meanwhile, we're just delighted that he can join us and squeeze in this time to be with us remotely. His research focuses on social and environmental dimensions of food and energy systems. And in recent years, his primary focus has been on energy commodity chains with an emphasis on the solar industry. His recent research on solar energy commodity chains appears in his book, Solar Power, Innovation, Sustainability, and Environmental Justice, which as I read was scheduled for release by the University of California Press in April, 2019. So as a quick break in the introduction, is it out? It is, yes. It's actually the, All right. the number one new release on Amazon in energy production and extraction for as long as that Fabulous. Happens. Okay. so. Continuing with the introduction, Dr. Mulvaney, you can't talk yet. <laughs> Dr. Mulvaney's training was notably interdisciplinary. His BS is in chemical engineering and his master's in environmental policy studies, both from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Before heading to California for a PhD in environmental studies at UC Santa Cruz, he worked as a chemical process engineer for a Fortune 500 chemical manufacturer in New Jersey and West Virginia, and as a project engineer for a bioremediation startup at sites with MTBE spills, that's a gasoline additive. As a postdoc, he had an NSF Science Technology Society fellowship in environmental science policy and management at UC Berkeley. He's published extensively, and in addition to peer-reviewed journal articles and, of course, the book we just mentioned, he has written a number of white papers, edited reference volumes on green food, green energy, green technology, green politics, and served as an expert witness for the California Public Utilities Commission. He, too, has been active in the AAG as Secretary as Treasurer Secretary of the Energy and Environment Specialty Group and as a council member of the Cultural and Political Ecology Specialty Group. He's received a number of fellowships and awards, including the Dan Luton, Daniel Luton Best Paper Award a few years ago of the AAG's Energy and Environment Specialty Group. So his title is Land Use Conflict Over Solar Farms, Green Jobs, and Techno-Ecological Synergies in Energy Transitions. Okay, it's all yours. 
Great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. And I, I'm very much looking forward to, to re-listening to what I, I saw were really cool looking slides talking about other topics that I'm interested in learning more about. So um, today I'm going to talk about what I've noticed across the American West with, with a very California-centric focus um, around land use and, and rural development and, and thinking about um, some of the challenges that we're going to face as we start to deploy more and more solar, right? We have, um, even in California, we haven't rolled out all the solar we're going to need to, to decarbonize the grid. So what that means is we're going to need a lot more land. We're going to need a lot more workers. And, um, you know, what does that actually mean for the future of, of these landscapes and these communities? So um, next slide, let's go right into this. So one of the, the first things to point out, which may be obvious to most of us, is that we're shifting from subterranean resource, energy resources to ones that you have to collect more diffusely on the surface of the earth. So what you're seeing in this picture this is the desert sunlight solar farm. That solar farm has about 9 million solar panels and is about eight square miles. It generates about 550 gigawatts of power at peak. And as you could tell, that's Joshua Tree National Park in the background. As you could tell, it's a pretty imposing, it creates quite an imposition on, on landscapes, particularly this is uh, sited on public lands, where in California, really the first big projects were being sited on public lands. You can really describe California's rollout in, in three phases, starting with um, the eastern Mojave Desert and a lot of the public lands there, a little bit more south near the Salton Sea in the Colorado Desert, and then further west in the Antelope Valley area of the Mojave Desert. And, and more recently, there's been a lot more build out in the Central Valley of California. So we've seen somewhat of a, a geographic pattern there. And, and part of the reason is solar developers are going for the closest access to transmission. That's really the driver where projects are being put. And then once you put enough projects in a certain area, those, those sites get overloaded um, in terms of how much power they can deliver, and then they start having to curtail, which means they start losing some of the economic benefit of having that big giant project. Next slide. This project also has 9 million solar panels, but it's a little more spread out. This is on the, the Carrizo Plain, um, near Carrizo Plain National Monument, which is the, the largest intact native grassland in California. Um, and when I was going to visit this site when it was being built, a major concern from the community there was a loss of the rural character. And as people came and visited this place, which was very remote and seemed like a, it was lost to history. When you go there, it was, it was a place that didn't seem like California. If you've been to the urban places in California, um, you seem like you were transported back into the West. And the communities were very concerned about the imposition of these industrial facilities in their communities. And from this picture, you can see just the magnitude of of the, these these projects. So again, about eight million solar, or about nine million solar panels, about eight square miles um, taken up. In this case, it's a little more broken up because there was uh, concern about pronghorn antelope being able to move about this landscape. So they're spaced out a little bit differently. Next slide. This is the Desert Sunlight Project when it was being built. So the other aspect of this is you could see the, the project involved a pretty heavy handed land use change. They literally send eight to 12 scrapers out there and scrape the landscape to make it a more homogenous landscape to get rid of the burrows. First they remove or evict any endangered species or threatened or protected species. And then they, they really try to create a, a landscape that's easy to walk across and, and can be driven across without having to worry about being stuck by a cactus or um, you know, have, falling, having a worker twist their ankle in a burrow or, or something like that. And I'll come back to that because I think that land use practice is, is part of the reason that many of these projects have been um, opposed by so many, many groups. But, but the upshot here is very significant land use and intensive land use change. Next slide. This is a project called the, the Ivanpah Sol Solar Project. There's nothing there just yet, but this is also showing you uh, an impact from solar projects, which is, in this case, they were required because there's rare plants to leave most of the landscape intact. But you could see from 
the, the image here, um, the, the cuts for the roads, which will then be used to wash and first build and then wash the solar panels later on. So in this case, not all projects, or the, this case, this image shows that not all projects have such an intensive land use change, but they all require a lot of roads. And the same can be said for wind farms. That's probably the, the biggest uh, land use change associated with a wind farm is, is the actual building of all the roads to, to maintain them. Next slide. This is the uh, Western Mojave Desert. This is the Antelope Valley Poppy Reserve, which you may have seen lots of pictures of, uh, where people are taking pictures of all these poppies that are in bloom um, this time of year. And I've gone to this area for you know, the last 10 years studying these solar projects. And if you squint to the lower picture, you can kind of make out some of the, the, box, the, the darker areas where there's actually um, giant solar farms now that, that weren't there many years ago. So again, a, play, a lot, place where people go for its rural characteristics, its wilderness characteristics to see these wildflowers suddenly has all these industrial facilities around them um, where they never had them before. So this creates a little bit of frictions um, and creates some more land use controversy in these regions. So next slide. This is that Ivanpah project that I showed you earlier with the road cuts when it was finalized. This is a project that we probably will not see any more of in California, and I'd be surprised if we see any more in the American West anywhere. These are solar power towers, and they've had some pretty serious issues with um, mitigating the impact from avian species. What happens in this, they're using mirrors to focus light on a receiver at the top, and when they put this plant in standby mode, they raise the heat up and it's about, it's over 2000 degrees temperature. They, they create basically a, a halo of heat above the, the receivers that you see at the top of the screen on the top of the tower. And um, this project has, I think the last count was somewhere around 2300 or 2500 um, avian species lost, I'm sorry, individual animals lost every year from partly through co uh, collisions with the mirrors, but also by Fl uh, flying through that heat halo. Fish and Wildlife has a new term, it's called a streamer, and that's a bird that flies through the heat and ba basically disintegrates. Next slide. The desert tortoise was one of the species that was prominently featured in that Ivanpah solar project. There were some issues with counting. It's very hard to count desert tortoises because they spend such a large portion of their time underground and they're hard to see because they kind of look like rocks sometimes. Um, <clears throat> this project was built and in, in they had to translocate somewhere near 150 individual tortoises. Um, they actually had to build a nursery for tortoises because they had to overwinter them there. And the, the translocation of the tortoises coupled with the mitigations associated with the uh, avian and bat species that had a, have a management plan in place and there's actually a rare plant that needed a special management plan. This cost about $52 million just to mitigate for this project. It's a $2 billion project, so maybe a drop in the bucket overall, but um, certainly created jobs. You had people out there, biologists and, and conservationists, and even had lawyers at one point involved with this project. So, um, to, but my point here, though, is that there, the challenge of putting large projects where you're, they're somewhat sprawling, right? There's a term that Nature Conservancy uses called energy sprawl, um, poses specific challenges for a lot of species, um, as well as uh, individual animals and, and things like that, wildlife in general. Next slide. San Joaquin Kit Fox. This one was an interesting story. So this is Carrizo Plain National Monument, uh, the picture I showed you in the beginning, um, the Topaz Solar Project. This is, on, I'm sorry, it's on the edge of Carrizo Plain National Monument, not in it. Um, this project, they actually, again, spent a, quite a bit of money figuring out how many uh, kit foxes were on site. There have been a couple of reports that this has actually been somewhat of a success story where they've actually been able to coexist in this particular landscape with the solar farms. They built little kit fox dens within the solar plant where they're able to kind of co-mingle with the solar panels and, and leave without being trapped by coyotes and such. There have been some projects that have been actually very bad for the kit fox. There's one in the Colorado desert that um, when during the eviction process they used coyote urine and that coyote urine transferred 
Kit Fox, uh, distemper to the Kit Fox population for the first time that recorded. So, so there's been challenges with that particular species. Next slide. This is another uh, species that requires mitigation usually for solar projects. Now there's been, I mentioned a shift toward the Central Valley of California where the land is a little bit more degraded and you have the opportunity to build on marginal, marginal farmland or in some cases prime farmland, but the Farm Bureau does not like the farm, they're losing any fi uh, prime farmland in California. Um, Sorry about that. Deep. Um, so the the issue here is you need forage habitat for uh, the Swainson's hawk, which is another species that has special status in California. And where for every acre that you develop associated with a solar farm, you might have to go out and acquire mitigation lands. So there's more economic activity there, which is the purchase of lands for mitigation in um, that might then be foraging habitat for these species. I put this press release at the bottom to show um, one of the challenges with that, which is that one com a county in California received a lot of money from a solar developer because of the mitigations and then they rolled it into their general fund. And we're not sure that that money is actually gonna get spent on that species now. So there's a lawsuit um, that's been launched. I'm not sure what the current status is, but it has not been resolved yet. So in some cases you have mitigations that don't actually end up mitigating anything because you projects you're supposed to. Next slide. The loss of the rural character is another issue. It's somewhat of an aesthetic issue, but if you think also about why people go out to these places for the amenity values, you know, that could actually be an economic issue as well as you transform um, open and wild spaces into uh, industrialized spaces, you could create issues there. This is the Silurian Valley. This is a space between Mojave Preserve and, and Death Valley National Monument, which is, I'm sorry, National Park, which has been a um, very important corridor for species moving between um, both of those landscapes. This is a spot where the, the a solar project, a solar and wind project actually combined was proposed on this site and the, the Bureau of Land Management actually rejected this project. So this is one that was, this is a space that was never developed for solar, but was controversial for quite a while because the project was proposed and, and it almost seemed like the project was going to happen. Next slide. The other issue you face with developing land out in the American West is in uncovering lots of um, sacred places, places that are important to Native Americans that have cultural resources. This is um, in Blythe, California, where some intaglios were damaged by a solar project road that was cutting through. Next slide. You can see that on the left there, those are pictures of a geoglyph that was damaged for uh, the construction of the Blythe solar project. I remember walking a site with um, a historian of Native Americans um, named Alfredo Figueroa, and he took me up to the top of this little hilltop and pointed at a solar project called the Genesis Project. That's on this, uh, you can see it described in the, the lower right corner there. Um, you know, a year before this LA Times article came out, he pointed to that spot and said, that, that's, that's where my, el my, my ancestors live. You know, they, there's a watering hole on that site and everywhere that there's a watering hole, there's cremation sites and artifacts and things like that. And that's what in fact happened in this case, they had to actually cordon off part of that solar project because of the uh, cultural resource impacts. Next slide. Water use, we can compare it to natural gas and, and coal and other resources and it looks pretty good from an energy perspective, but these solar projects are usually in very arid areas. So, and often they're dependent on groundwater and there's a lot of wells that are, we have a paper right now that we're about to finalize where we counted wells that were drop for solar projects and water use. This was a, a smaller sample that got published in the journal Land Use Science a few years ago, or last year, um, where we looked at water use. And from this, you, the, the upshot from this is that land use practice that I described earlier, where they basically scrape the land and damage the, any, any uh, biological organisms on top, does become a dust nuisance. And in fact, the construction is where most of the water use is, even on these PV projects, um, for dust control to comply with the Clean Air Act. We've had projects where there's car pileups in, in Antelope Valley. We have projects that get shut down for dust nuisance. So these are things that um, you know, could be fixed through policy, but haven't quite been implemented fully in practice yet. Next slide. This is the Pinoch Valley. This is an area also that was, um, it took about 10 years to build 
this project from when it was proposed, partly because of some endangered species that lived on site, including kit fox, um, a blunt-nosed leopard lizard, some other uh, species that are pretty much stop building projects if you're finding these species, types of species. Um, you can see here the rural amenities also factored into this. Um, this was not prime farmland, this was grazing land, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Farm Bureau has said on several occasions they were very concerned about the role of um, big solar projects um, taking up prime farmland in California because that's obviously a major uh, agricultural state. Next slide. Batteries. So as we're rolling out more solar projects, we are starting to see more batteries. Um, this is not a, a mine that produces batteries, but this is a mine in, right above that Ivanpah project I mentioned earlier that produces rare earth elements, which is also critical for certain kinds of clean energy technologies such as wind turbines and such. And this is associated obviously mining activity with mining activity. It's very challenging for water and for land and on all of the things that you, you're familiar with. Um, this is by the Mali Corp mine. Next slide. Placer claims in Nevada. There's over, I think it's now 14,000 placer claims in Nevada to evaporate um, for lithium brines, essentially for batteries. And here you can see in Nevada has the whole system. They have the potential lithium source. They don't have all the metals, but they have the lithium source. They have the gigafactory, which is some, it's, it's, a bit suburban. It's almost in the rural areas of, of Sparks, Nevada. It's not quite in the city of Sparks. Um, so it is somewhat outside of the, the region. And the Yellow Pine Solar Project is a proposed solar project. It's going to have a lot of battery storage in Nevada. So um, again, more extractive industries, more land use change from solar, um, but uh, accompanied with some job growth as well. Next slide. This is just to show you what it looks like in South America when you extract lithium brines. These are all evaporation pine, ponds that have been built. And if you squint, it's a pretty high resolution photo, so but you, you have to squint. You can actually see all the wells where they, they, the impact isn't just where you're seeing the ponds. If you look throughout that landscape, you could see roads, you could see um, wells that are being dug that are, um, they affect groundwater. Again, when you're, pulling water, when you're pulling water out of the desert, often you're pulling fossil groundwater out of the desert and that's lowering the groundwater tables and, my understanding, speaking with some colleagues, that there are some indigenous communities in and around here whose water may have been affected already by declining water tables. Next slide. But the bright side is we're creating lots of opportunity with these uh, with these with these industries. Um, you could see the photovoltaic installer here, and, and I don't know if they're breaking apart um, the industrial projects versus the rooftop installers, but it's a pretty well-paying job and it's the highest growing occupation according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics right now. So that, that's um, kind of an economic driver for, what, for what's going on here, or, or maybe it's an economic side effect of what's actually happening here. Um, you can look down below, this is showing you how many jobs per megawatt installed for different kinds of solar deployment scenarios. So utility scale projects are generating about 2.4 jobs per megawatt. Residential projects are generating up almost five jobs per megawatt there. So it's a pretty big difference, almost twice as many jobs when you're doing rooftop. You can imagine it's much more complicated. You have ladders involved and roofs are different. And, and those utility projects, as I showed you, they're pretty much homogenous landscapes where it's pretty easy to get people moving around. Next slide. This is perhaps an area, I, I thought this is an interesting thing to put in here into the conversation. Um, they, the solar industry does have difficulty hiring in these places. So we're talking about projects being built out in rural areas. This is a study from a website I found called Solar Wake Up. It's a solar job census and they asked employers, what are the challenges you have in terms of hiring people in this space and lack of technical, I'm sorry, lack of experience or technical knowledge turns out to be the, the predominant factor for and I guess you could lump in insufficient qualifications really into that same category in some ways um, into the challenges that these industries face as they do move into rural areas. So it kind of speaks to a need for job training and more education around, um, you know, or technical training and things like that in, in these areas. Next slide. 
with those jobs, however, have come some challenges in California. And again, this is a very California focused thing where we have something called valley fever. It's caused by a fungal borne pathogen that's in soil. And when you have high levels of disturbance, um, you potentially get exposure to valley fever. And these are two centers for disease control studies looking at two different solar farms, one in Monterey County, in the drier part of Monterey County inland, um, and then one out in um, at the Topaz Solar Farm, which was um, the project I mentioned earlier on the Carrizo Plain. And here you had uh, workers, they said it was partly because they weren't wearing masks, probably, but two pretty severe outbreaks of valley fever amongst uh, workers working on these sites. Next slide. So I have this word technological or techno-ecological synergies in my slides. So I should talk about that for a minute. And this is something I, I borrowed from um, Dr. Rebecca Hernandez from the University of California, Davis, who does really fantastic work and trains wonderful graduate students to do similar work on land use change from solar and looking at um, benefits and things like that. And I'll just point you to the left-hand slide, um, the left-hand part of the slide. This is uh, EPA's Repowering America's Lands program, which is basically looking at brownfields, abandoned landfills, um, abandoned mines, recre sites, Superfund sites as opportunities to put solar. And they did a process of screening these, access to transmission, flatness, slope, all these things. Um, and you could see from this image, or it doesn't have the numbers, but the, from, from the statement below, 1.7 million acres are available from the EPA's Repowering America's Lands program. That would basically be more than 12 times California's peak demand. So there's no shortage of disturbed land. And if you actually look at a lot of those um, abandoned landfills specifically, those are a lot in the rural areas of California. So you have opportunities to turn a lot of, um, of these areas into power plants essentially. And maybe the job creation isn't the number one uh, local benefit derived by these communities, but certainly the sales tax on that electricity could be pretty um, hefty and, and help a lot of these communities. Next slide. Agrivoltaics, another opportunity we might have in the Central Valley of California, where you can kind of co um, have coexisting solar farms and either uh, animal agriculture or in the upper left hand side, you could see greenhouses that put solar panels over or in the, the side to the uh, picture to the upper right, you could see um, you know, in this case, I don't actually know what that crop is, but it's something that they're obviously using a tractor on. Next slide. And then something that we've been exploring or having conversations about that we're hoping to get some funding for at some point, but the National Renewable Energy Lab is also doing similar work. I just saw a paper that came out yesterday is enhancing these sites for ecosystem services. So as solar farms roll out in the Central Valley, you have almond orchards that require apiaries and honeybees be installed. Um, and when a solar plant comes across the street and basically removes all the vegetation, it basically creates unhappy neighbors, right? A situation where you might even have that kind of a land use conflict that isn't related to wildlife, but is actually related to agricultural production. They don't, people don't want a dust nuisance as their neighbor. They don't want their trees covered in dust. So the idea is to restore these sites to be more ecologically or agroecologically friendly, maybe perhaps install pollinators in them. Um, we also know that from vegetation, from the transpiration, from the uh, from photosynthesis, that they actually cool the solar panels and that makes them operate a little more efficiently. So there's actually a co-benefit there. Next slide. And you can see in the lower corner there, that's um, from a startup company that's trying to promote this idea by actually selling honey that they've produced within the solar farm in this case. So again, co-use of land. I think the, the advantage that solar has that none of our energy technologies have is that you can actually put it on top of other things. It could actually, you can have dual use of land and that's a, a big benefit. We just don't have the incentives right now or necessarily the, the research findings to support the argument um, for, for making this cohabitation more common. Because again, you'll drive around, like I mentioned, I was out in the desert last week and, or two weeks ago, and I was seeing solar projects I'd never seen before, and they were doing the same old thing about the bulldozing, scraping the land, and potentially creating land use conflict. Next slide. That's it. I'm done. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you guys have uh, some thoughts to share with me or critique or criticism. <laughs>
Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That was quite interesting. Um, what questions do we have for Destin? Okay. Yeah, thanks. That was a really, really good talk. Uh, really, uh, I learned a lot and enjoyed it. Uh, even though I've seen a lot of the things that you, you just showed us in terms of the facilities. So here's here's a sort of interesting or question for you, is the siting of these things. One is all those, those sites in the desert, and you didn't mention this, but I know it's important. They all require transmission of that power uh, into areas where it's going to be consumed. And the building of those transmission lines and then, of course, where they cross flammable landscapes, uh, that's a huge problem that, that really extends the, uh, the negative impacts. And you did show some of the uh, agrivoltaics, and we have areas uh, like along the west side of the uh, San Joaquin River Valley, which are really actually, because of soil, hopeless for agriculture. And yet they and they already have transmission lines and things like that. Why has there been such a focus on using these uh, uh, using the desert lands and stuff like that? Aside from the fact maybe they have a little bit higher sunlight and all that, rather than going into some of these brownfield sites or or, or or former agricultural sites, which is simply not not good for agriculture. Do you think that's shifting? And do you think that has something to do with with capital? You know, you can get this land for free. You can use it for free. You don't have to worry about the people that are there because no people are living there. So it's minimal benefits to anybody, basically, but it, it maximizes profit. I just, just wonder what you might want to say on that. I, I absolutely have some ideas on that. So, yeah, absolutely. The main driver why solar projects are where they are is transmission, access to transmission. I've had developers say, if I do an interconnection study, it's, there's, a tenfold, there's a tenfold difference in cost sometimes. Um, between a good site and a bad site, and I'm going to go with the good site. Um, the, your point about public land, so we've seen a very severe drop off in applications for public lands. So I think the, the public land story is partly a historical artifact of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, where lots of projects were put on pro public lands to have access to that funding. Uh, on public lands, they are allowed to fast track a project under an executive order passed under um, the Bush administration that allows the fast tracking of, of energy projects on, on public lands. So in order to have a shovel ready project, a lot of projects were being proposed on public lands. Now, not everybody got the fast track status and not every project um, received ARA funding in any way. But the, the, the fact that they had started that process meant the ball was rolling and they, and, and they continued to build out those projects. Um, the, and the cost, I think, now, you know, over the, the decade I've been following is power purchase agreement has fallen by 10 times, meaning that the cost of electricity to the utility is 10 times less from a solar project than it was 10 years ago. And what that means is, is the costs of some of these, um, you know, permitting, mitigations, the leases themselves may be creeping into um, the overall picture, and, and that could be pushing project. I mean, that could be part of the reasons we're not seeing the build out in public lands. There's also an issue of curtailment. So we've overbuilt in certain parts of the state. We basically pay Arizona to consume our excess solar electricity certain times of the day or, or the season, and, and people don't want to do that anymore. So um, the, I mentioned Rebecca Hernandez's work. One of her graduate students led a paper that, that Rebecca's a, um, a co-author on. It's about land sparing um, opportunities. And it does talk about those selenium contaminated lands in the West Central Valley. Um, there's a couple issues with that. One of them is the water issue, um, which is that a lot of those landowners own the water rights and they're unwilling to, accept to, to, to give the water rights along with the land. So we got to figure out ways to make solar power plants operate without water. That might make it a little easier. We got to make, we got to figure out to, how to get big agricultural interests to give up their water rights, which sounds even more challenging than making a solar power plant operate with no water. Did I answer all the questions? I'm not, there's a couple parts. Mm -hmm. that. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, Dustin, this is uh, Marilyn Brown. I wanted to uh, thank you for a great talk. Your uh, photos are fabulous, as they have been in all three talks today. Buying your book just to get you know the, the graphics is probably <laughs> going to be one of my motivators. 
Um, I wanted to talk with you about your discussion and description about job creation and just put on kind of um, my skeptical hat uh, from someone who's done a lot of employment assessments of energy investments. Uh, when you do that assessment, you've got to look at the jobs that are created when facilities are constructed and jobs that are required to um, to run projects, and then you've got to do some kind of present valuation, maybe, or you know, somehow make comparisons along those lines. Uh, and you'll find that solar is not so very attractive when you look at the full life cycle. Um, neither, of course, are many of the traditional other supply options like fossil or nuclear. Maybe may, maybe a little better, but what's best, of course, is um, energy efficiency. <laughs> energy efficiency is where you get most of the jobs. That's a very high labor intensive relative to the cost of uh, materials, and it's just continuous. It's just always <laughs> more that can be done. It seems. I just wonder uh, if you've done any of that little more sophisticated, you know, input output, direct and direct, and do induced jobs, and made some comparisons across different alternative energy uh, supply and demand side options using those uh, more sophisticated strategies. The short answer is. No, but I have some thoughts on this. But when I started working on this, first of all, I, I actually don't even believe this, some of the, the stats I, I just showed you earlier, which was the comparison between residential rooftop per megawatt and the um, utility scale per megawatt. And the reason for that is that most of those jobs that are in the utility scale sector, you, know, you might have you know, a, a thousand construction jobs, um, but you'll have five permanent jobs. And whereas those residential sector, um, you know, those are usually more career oriented jobs. Like people aren't going and doing solar and then doing something else. I mean, some might be electricians doing multiple things, but um, they're usually doing solar all the time. Whereas like that Ivanpah project I showed you earlier, that was built by Bechtel using union labor, but the union labor was bust out from Las Vegas every day. So, or they stayed in, in Prim once in a while, they, they, they'd be bust out for the week. Um, and then they went on to build something else, a bridge or some, something different. So it, it, it's really hard to pin down these job numbers and link them, uh, particularly the, the big construction project, projects that require, um, you know, that, that workforce that's, that's a bit different and, and more flexible. Um, so there was a tool from NREL, the National Renewable Energy Labs, called JEDI. I forget what it stands for, but some economic development thing. And they used to have the photovoltaic model on there. And I, I fortunately was able to download one the last time it was up there, but I noticed it's not up there anymore. They have the other energy sectors. And, and I'm wondering why that is. If they, they, When I asked, I wrote to them and said, hey, what happened to your, your solar job calculator? Because they, they did that. They basically say, oh, you create construction jobs, then you have the truck the guy is selling food and you create all these kind of added, you have all these adders. Um, and they basically said the data were, were too old. So I think that's another area we, that we maybe, you know, even this job census report that I, I put together, or I put in, in, into this talk that was put together by that solar wake up site. Um, it's not doing a sophisticated enough analysis to be able to parse the different kinds of ways we might roll this technology out the different combinations, the different size and magnitude, location. So I, I think that that's a, an important research need. Yeah, the one um, ultra sophisticated other perspective to jobs is that if you put in place a energy resource that's less expensive to uh, meet energy service requirements, uh, let's say energy efficiency, you know, being so cheap, but also maybe a very cheap generation option like cogeneration in um, industrial plants, then um, the rates can decline and everyone can benefit. They have more revenues that they can, that they can spend because the, um, you know, they're able to redirect their income to other 
other uh, assets they can buy. Yeah. And so they're all kind of, that's a that's a type of uh, you don't even get that in, in input output studies. You've got to go through a, a computational general equilibrium model, find out how the different energy resources balance each other when you insert something new and what's it going to do to prices, both electricity as well as your generation, your fossil fuels and other inputs. And, you know, it takes a lot, a whole lot. You got to crank a lot of uh, levers to get those final numbers, but they can be very important. I was able to estimate that for cogeneration, the fact that you could lower the electricity costs had a bigger impact than almost anything else on jobs and the economy. And that's just something you can't estimate very easily. We do need JEDI to be reinstated or tools like that. Yeah, most of the other, the other technologies were there. They just removed the photovoltaics. So I'm not sure why the other technologies have better data, but yeah, that's important, very important. I think all that, their, their data is very old, all across the board in JEDI. Um, yeah. One yep. area that we, um, if I could just one, one last thing on the jobs thing, and it's not related to any stuff I've talked about, but um, last week we, or I guess it was three weeks ago now, we I, I presented before the California Public Utilities Commission. There was a memorandum of understanding between the Energy Commission, Public Utilities Commission, Cal Recycle, the Department of Toxic Substances Control, and the Air Resources Board to come up with a plan for end of life solar. Because basically our last solar recycler in the state went bankrupt and we, they just sent it to a smelter. So not everything was even being recovered, but you know, the silver was being recovered, that's important. So we've been trying to advocate for extended producer responsibility in the state. Um, Washington state has a law like that. I actually wrote much of the text. They had to withdraw it because I marked it up so much and had to resubmit it to um, their legislature. New York State also um, has an extended producer responsibility. It just make sure it makes sure that anybody who sells a solar panel in the state has to set aside money, and that money can grow in an account, and then that money is there to pay for recycling. Because right now California has no recycling of solar. There, if you, if you bring solar panels to a recycler, the Department of Toxic Substances Control has advised them to turn it away. So it basically, goes to landfill. So that's a place we could create some jobs. Is, is at the end of life too. So. Hey, I'm sorry, I interrupted someone about to ask any question. Uh, I was just saying, we need to have those producer responsibility requirements for coal plants, too. <laughs> okay, let's have a question from Bill, and then I think we want to open this up more broadly. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, Dustin. This is Bill Selecki from uh, City University of New York. Uh, great talk. I just, uh, you know, our remit is sort of looking at energy, you know, energy transitions in rural America. And, you know, obviously you spoke a lot on, on the solar side. Is there, you know, and this is maybe a too big a question, but can you give us a th quick, quick thumbnail? Like, are there like the issues with wind? I mean, how, you know, what's the differences? Are there key differences that we might want to consider as part of our discussion? vis-a-vis uh, -vis the solar experience? I mean, some of the, I know the environmental effects, you know, birds, et cetera. But are there other kind of key points that you know might be significantly different from solar? In some ways, I, I don't think so. I mean, in California, most of the on-land wind is built out. Like, there's not any new. There's very little wind being new wind being proposed right now. So, and I don't know what that would look like elsewhere. Um, it's very similar in the sense that it has. Um, you know, very few operators on site when you're there. Although I think there's a bit more repair that goes into those. So there, there could be more kind of um, technical jobs associated with that for repairing and cleaning them. Um, whereas solar panels are, because there's no moving parts, there's a little less um, maintenance of them other than the, the washing and making sure that you replace broken ones and things like that. Um, so that's a really good question, and I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer that. Maybe there's other experts here that can, but um, my, my intuition is it's not that much different. But okay, it, great. It could be so, so, yeah. A quick, quick, so, so for California, you, uh, wind is all built out. I mean, uh, just a thumbnail off, sort of. Onshore, offshore. Oh, there'll be some oh, offshore. Okay, good. That's coming next. Got it, got it. 
and how about other parts? I mean, I know like Iowa, you know, Texas, et cetera, a lot of other places seem to be at least, you know, promoting it on the surface, meaning like, you know, they're, that's what they're promoting, but I don't know how much is, how much of that is really, uh, you know, real installation. Yeah. And you, the, th the benefit that I think of that comes to mind in those parts of the country, um, because again, California is a little bit different because a lot of the renewables are on public lands. And I think that makes it a somewhat different animal. Um, but when I read about ranchers getting together and forming a co-op to sell electricity, in some ways it's similar to the honey story that I told that toward the end where you're basically creating additional revenue streams for particular land owners. And I think that that's probably um, one of the key economic impacts. The, the other being, again, a lot, of, uh, a lot of sales tax gets generated through these because partly because the, the electricity is somewhat expensive. So in many ways, um, you know, depending on how, I guess some states don't have sales tax, but um, depending on how that's structured, um, there could be benefits that way. Some states actually have exemptions for, put, like California, you're not allowed to have property tax, I believe, on, on solar projects. So something I had heard once I had not verified that, but um, so that means that you don't necessarily always have tax benefits that circulate back into the economy, but, um, but sales tax is certainly a, a big piece of it. I think the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant in San Luis Obispo at one point was providing over 50% of the tax base for that, that area and sales tax for that whole County. So, so these big energy installations can have, if not direct job impacts, they certainly have other kinds of economic benefits that might go to schools and things like that. Great, thanks. Okay, let's um, I, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Jackie. I was going to say you might want to look at Christian Brandstrom's work. He's um, written a lot on Texas, um, and I know the Texas and Oklahoma landscape are somewhat similar. And I was just thinking about your like the the job thing. A lot of times in Oklahoma and Texas, there's also a shifting. So his work kind of shows about the legacy effects, and that actually the those ranchers getting together are mostly the corporate ranchers who can do these things. It's often squeezing out the small farmers or the small ranchers, which has a lot of actual local economic impacts because those large ranchers bring their stuff up on semi, they're not buying local, their children aren't in the school, they're not necessarily investing in the tax base. So there's there's other things. And then in Oklahoma, there's a lot of fights with um, native communities. So the Osage Nation sued um, one conglomerate of those ranchers that got together to um, put in one of those um, wind operations under the idea that they're destroying a sacred landscape. Also, there's a big tourism base for the high plains and, and, and the tall grass prairie and the bison and those kinds of things. And so there's, there's actually a lot of stuff. And Christian Branstrom would be a good person to look at. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Great. Well, I'm going to call on Julia, and then at this point, let's have our discussion be open for participation by all of us with questions to anybody. <laughs> Well, I was just, hi Dustin, it's Julia Haggerty. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the fiscal piece because I think it's a pretty complicated question. So um, the idea that there's a production generation tax that accrues locally, that's pretty exceptional to California. And most of the states that are um, trying to export energy are really struggling to figure out what a revenue stream looks like. And even when you have good revenue policy at the state level, you may not have distribution to local areas even if you have distribution to local areas, they may be limited in their ability to save and invest that. Um, so it's a sort of multi-scalar system. But I think, I guess I, I, I just think we need to, so maybe one other point on some interesting fiscal stuff. Um, I mentioned my colleagues at University of Wyoming, they're helping the state of Wyoming think about their um, fiscal policy because Wyoming is maybe the nation's leader in sort of vulnerability, current vulnerability to energy transitions, and they would like to export a lot of wind, and that's a challenging thing in these times. Um, and one of the things they found is that the New Mexico, which has one of the more aggressive um, tax regimes with respect to generating wind, um, actually has the lowest production cost. And one of the things that they do is enable local governments to bond to invest in wind projects, which brings down the cost of capital. 
and allows for um, a cheaper production cost, even though they have a higher effective tax rate on those projects. So it gets kind of like down into the weeds, but um, I think, yeah, that's cool, right? Well, I could tell you more about it, but I guess what I would suggest is that going back to Glenn's comments earlier, um, the idea that these big construction projects are going to create long-term economic benefits in the form of jobs or even taxes is kind of a flawed way to think about rural prosperity. Um, and, and what Glenn urges us to think about is how can local places um, share in the property and the capital that actually is behind these things. Um, and there's a whole set of policy issues with respect to limits on community-owned property, limits on local banking, all those kinds of things that are in the way of that. But I just, we can, and I totally agree with uh, Marilyn's observations about the limits and ways to do complicated modeling about net economic benefits. But I think when we're talking about rural places um, and benefits, getting, getting caught up in kind of the IO, IO battles about how many direct and in, indirect jobs and how much tax revenue doesn't really capture the fundamental structural issue, which is that local places don't own the capital that um, is really prospering from b building these things. Fantastic point. Yep. I'm going to keep that in mind. Really important. Yeah, you can look at local and and um, uh, out of territory ownership and imports of materials into the whole. So you can get at that, but it underscores that the, in my opinion, the most advantageous solar for any local community is rooftop solar. It's not the big solar farms, and you know that's the battle to be played with now. Of course, the utilities want to own the utility farms. Um, and then there's the battle between whether the rooftop solar is yours or is it leased, you know, all of that. I think that's a, you know, maybe for another day, a really good topic, but it has a lot of influence on, um, you were saying, if you have a solar farm, what are you displacing? On a rooftop, you're using um, land or whatever area that's, you know, already underutilized. So there's a big advantage to that. Um, I know we don't have quite enough rooftop space yet in the country to meet all of our needs, even if it was all solar, but it could go a long way. Yeah. And it would be locally, you know, locally advantageous, I would think. Most, most, uh, most of those solar deliverers, most of those solar companies putting rooftop solar on are local or at least within the state or regional. Yeah. Yeah, the, the rooftop. There's a couple studies that also show when you put roof, when you put solar on a roof, you actually reduce the heat gain that goes into the house, and you can lower someone's air conditioning bill. So there, there are definitely some. And, and then there's some studies that suggest behavioral change. Some, you know, the in different directions. Some say you, you consume more, but some say you consume less because now you suddenly have a envelope of trying to keep that bill at zero. So it kind of makes someone stay at a certain energy consumption more likely so it, i mean there's definitely questions and it, it, it the, the fundamental challenge is it goes right up against the the business model of the utilities and that's that's um that's something that that many states have have been grappling with for the last 10 years and some of these net metering debates and such so that's a really important point but it, it, the question is like how do you optimize both from you know that question about prosperity and, and benefits and when I, the funny thing was i was studying these solar projects out in the, the mojave desert realizing we're at a we have a housing crisis all these houses are underwater and i was like why can't you put all the solar why why, why are we building this two billion dollar solar project here we could put two billion dollars for the solar panels on people's rooftops make their houses more valuable lower their energy bills things like that and i don't think we I think, I don't know, we, we're not at the point where we're able to kind of come up with these idealized solutions in, in some ways. So I'm not sure what the, the strategy to make that happen would be, but, but I think there are pieces moving forward on some of these. Like non-grid or non-wires alternatives is a phrase people are using more and more, especially in California, where the you know, point was raised earlier that it didn't address, which is more transmission basically creates more fire risk right through the state. And that's not something we want to necessarily do. So So maybe there are new ways to think about future utility models where non-wires alternatives are, you know, are built into uh, something that benefits both the utility and the customer. I'm not sure how, how that looks though. 
Um, yeah, I actually, uh, just to follow up on this, I, I was going to ask you about rooftop also. Um, I, I live in Vermont where we have a tremendous amount of rooftop solar and actually we're a lot of the former dairy farms, dairies are having trouble, but they have high transmission capability because of the electrical systems in dairy. So a lot of the dairy farms have solar and we don't have dust. We have a lot of rain, so um, we don't have that kind of maintenance. But it, do you see action in California about moving to more urban systems? You know, I think about carports and as well as rooftops or other things where, I mean, in Vermont, we have sheep grazing underneath and you showed us the bees, but it just seems like there's a lot of opportunity for for dual purpose. And I wonder if there's much discussion happening at this time or if it's if the big utilities are really just controlling this the story. In, in full disclosure, I spent a lot of time at my grandmother's sister's dairy farm in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont milking cows when I was younger. So I know all about yes. Um the answer is, is, is sort of, yeah. I mean, we're starting to see, I mean, in, in my own town, I, you know, we have lots of parking lot, even actually around here in, in, in Santa Clara County, Silicon Valley, you're seeing more and more parking lots covered with solar. And, and as we move toward more electric vehicles, it just makes more sense to have that system more integrated. And I think people are thinking about how, how to make that all work a little bit better, like having... I mean, in your ideal situation, you have parking lots covered with solar and you have cars underneath them. Um, and those cars are being charged by the solar or, or maybe not fully, but are, those batteries in the cars are playing some sort of um, you know, grid support, to pick up voltage sags and things like that, that might happen on the electrical grid. So people are thinking about it. I mean, there's, there's some really incredible work happening at the National Renewable Energy Labs and even pilot projects um, you know, at the CPUC on, on trying to integrate some of these things. So, and, and I think people, I think the story about how land use change or how much land it's going to take to decarbonize if we're going to have solar uh, be a main you know, a backbone of that system, um, people are realizing that, that, that there is more conversation now. Like when I first talked about this, people were like, well, who cares? It's just wasteland out there. And then you know, I bring back these pictures and then now suddenly people get more interested and then they go out there and they're like, oh, I was going camping. This place I used to go camping is now a solar farm. So um, I think the story is traveling more and I, I think people are starting to think about that. You know, it, it, I, I think what dominates the narrative is, is utility scale is just so cheap. And I think that that's the wrong way to be thinking about it because the question is cheap to who is what's cheap to the developer, cheap to the ratepayer, not always the case. And, and I think that that's, if we want to be thinking about how to get ourselves out of the conundrum we've created with energy crisis or, or market failures or whatever it is, it's maybe it's the, the, the quest for cheapness that got us here in the first place. Maybe we should be paying a little bit more for our electricity and protecting low income customers at the same time put that caveat in there. Well, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I just think we also have to think about where the investment capital model is, right? So there's the whole thing about rate recovery, but then investor-owned utilities have capital that they need to reinvest in facilities. Um, and my understanding partly about the big build-out on public lands was not only because there were various administrative pushes for that, but because of the way the production tax credit was established, um, which is essentially like a tax equity uh, way for investment capital to find another source to return capital. Um, so I think, I don't know the answers, but when we talk about distributed scale issues, we want to think about um, what's necessary to diminish the leverage that investment capital has at working at scale right now. Yeah, I should make, I mean, I'm painting distributed as kind of a savior here, but there was a big investigation into Solar City about them jacking up prices because of, you know, they're backed by Bank of America and that's providing their, their liquidity. So, um, yeah, I think that that's something to be, I, I'm certainly going to be more tuned into that now thinking about it because I think it is a really important question. So thank you, Julia, for that. Hang on. Okay. Before we have Bill's question, we have a question from one of our online people. 
Uh, and it's a follow-up to Julia's comment. In the Canadian hydro projects I've been looking at, there's a growing trend of profit-sharing agreements, sometimes for the hydro projects, and it just moves, and sometimes for the industries that use the electricity. But others have critiqued this kind of thing as enrolling local slash rural cultures and communities into neoliberalized production and exploitation of local and traditional resources and livelihoods. How would you see this kind of profit sharing approach in the spectrum of options for rural communities? And I should note that these are often First Nation lands and communities. Um, well, I think so profit sharing is gets at the heart of the issue, right, which is like, can can local places actually share in the returns on these things? Um, Betsy just whispered to me exactly what I was going to say, which is that then you want to look at those mechanisms really carefully because um, if the company's not making a profit, then the community's not making a profit. And pipelines, which is, so I don't know about the hydro projects at all. Um, but, you know, pipelines have mostly been doing pretty well recently, but anything that's in a, you know, trading in a globally based commodity is going to see real fluctuation. And again, there are these questions about um, can communities set aside reserves to compensate for downturns in the cycle in, in the American West? Many places are literally prohibited from establishing a reserve at the county level, right? You can't carry a positive balance from year to year. So um, I, I think that the philosophy is right. And to be totally cliche, the devil is in the details. Well, actually, um, it's a general question. So are, are we ready for general questions? Sure. Okay. Well, you know, um, I mean, the, all the talks and the conversation together are really great. Um, and there's lots of these sort of threads about, I mean, it was just mentioned, um, you know, uh, profit sharing and sort of community reserves and all these sort of, you know, a range of different things. And I guess I, I'll, I'm going to put on, you know, the committee hat, I guess, for a moment, you know, um, you know, I think we've illustrated well um, the importance and the value of the geographic perspective on these kinds of questions. So I think that's a uh, broadly defined. Um, you know, that's that's kind of a, a given. I guess the question I have um, is connected to you know the question of policy and particularly federal policy. Like, where are those windows? I mean, you know, I mean, I've always you know been chirping along here before you guys the you guys as speakers came in that you know there's been this retrenchment of federal policy and sort of like you know these a lot of these things were pushed and pressed you know in rural areas through uh, federal, uh, federal initiatives you know coupled with you know a lot of capital investment but there's been this sort of retreat so you know is there are there particular places where federal policy could play a role or should play a role we mentioned public lands and I guess Part of the other, you know, more even detailed question is, you know, with respect to this committee within the National Academy, the idea of like drawing in federal agencies to sort of be, hey, wow, this is really interesting. You know, we want to kind of engage with these debates and, you know, see what we can do, you know, vis-a-vis -vis what else goes on in Washington. So are there any kind of, and that's a, that's a broad, big, broad question, um, you know, the federal policy angles that, you know, you think are just really so possible or so, you know, needed in certain spaces. That's well, who wants to take this one on? <laughs> I think I see Betsy wiggling her finger toward the microphone. I'm, I'm going to try to sort of dance around what you're saying. Um, first of all, I, I want to explain why I've been texting and I've been back and forth with Benham in Kentucky and the solar panels are on the roof. People have gone and looked. So Google <laughs> is at fault. So, yeah. <laughs> and speaking of citizen science here and people actually going out and looking at things, just uh, following up on your question about federal policy and the goals of this committee, and uh, I'm just, thank you again for um, inviting me to be part of this. It's been extremely helpful. Um, I wonder if 
It, it seems like in a lot of our conversations, part of the problem is the gap between the intent of law and then what happens in administrative law as things get sort of, as Mary Christina Wood says, parceled out between agencies and commodities. Um, and on one hand, we're hearing a lot of common themes and sort of common factors, but the, 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 it's would it be possible to set up a sort of scholarly conversation as um, as Julia so wonderfully started with these ideas of frameworks about the, the kind of indicators of uh, planning, like land use planning and uh, local economic planning and, and sort of balancing all these factors, um, and then um, bring in... Um, in, and, and set it up in such a way that we can bring in citizens who are experimenting with different kinds of planning to uh, discuss the kinds of indicators that are being used to assess uh, impacts and and sort of compare uh, overarching legal and regulatory frameworks between commodities. I mean, for instance, one of the things I'm thinking about is, you know, who owns the sun? If many natural resources are actually nationally owned, so if we if we said renewables also are owned by the nation, and building renewables is part of of our climate strategy, then does that fundamentally change the sort of legal framework around wealth generation mm -hmm. from it? I I don't even know where I'm going with that, but um, so. Is there, um, I, I, it just feels like we need to um, have more of a national conversation about what the platforms are to establish more of a common energy framework that can be open to local experimentation and conversations. Um, I uh, feel that there's quite a bit of possibility in the effort that was started at the Department of Interior under President Obama to join the U.S. to the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative and develop a very good portal f that included renewables and other extractive commodities and a sort of a suite of, of data points that uh, are, have been internationally formulated to help people track the resource curse. And um, that data portal is still up and functioning. Um, so that could possibly be a, a site from which to build out some of this, this uh, sort of cross-regional conversation. So that's a, that's a very general <laughs> question. I'm wondering if either Julia or Dustin would like also to talk about the federal policy question. Well, I mean, I guess just briefly that um, there's nothing like a federal mandate to sort of bring about crisis and change, right? Um, and so when we had um, the Clean Power Plan, we had suddenly a lot of scrambling and discussions among utilities that has largely abated. Um, and we've let market, we're letting the market do the work now to say, hey, these, you know, the cost of production of these resources is cheaper, the fuel costs are less, um, but that's different than a uh, regulatory driven process. And I think just to, to broaden up from what Betsy was offering, so there's the regulatory drivers that are going to precipitate change, and then there's sort of all the administrative law and practice and implementation part that really does have huge effects in places. So if the Reclaim Act is successful in um, being appropriated and, and passed, then there'll be lots of questions about whether it's implemented in a way that is beneficial to places. Um, so, and then, you know, there are still this question about being careful never to disconnect what's happening at the federal level with these state and local policies that are turn out to be really influential when you're just thinking about rural economies. That's also oh, but also, also SEC regulations and, and rules around bankruptcy. I mean, mm. Mm. we're talking about billions of dollars of debt that were restructured that would have gone to, um, you know, reclamation of this massively important national project uh, and companies that are now trading again on the New York Stock Exchange. That's crazy. 
I'll, I'll just offer up a couple. Um, one of the mechanisms that, that led to probably some of the, the, the worst solar projects from a habitat perspective in terms of habitat loss and species having to be translocated or distemper being transferred to them was the BLM's mandate to develop public lands for renewable energy. I think, first of all, that was interpreted as a mandate. There's nowhere in the legislation that says mandate. But um, that basic, I mean, the rationale, I get it. It's like they've been giving money to the fossil fuel, in, or they've been giving public lands to the fossil fuel industry for so long. We should get some too. We're the renewable energy industry. We're better than them. Um, but they're different landscapes, they're different parts of the world. And essentially, that's what caused it, it causes bad decisions. You basically are removing money from the local communities because instead of a landowner, and there are plenty of land, it was funny, I'd be driving around, it says solar ready land is like the most common real estate sign you see out in that area. And that means that land wasn't being sold. That means that the, the sales tax on a land purchase wasn't being kind of recouped in the local community. Um, and basically that money was going right into the federal, the federal budget from the leases and, and, and such. So um, by that mandate dropping down, not only did it cause all these ecological problems, perhaps some political backlash because of the problems that the solar projects caused. And third, you were basically moving money directly back into the federal pockets as of, instead of circulating that in the local communities. And not only that, that, that meant that basically projects being competed, that were competing, you know, it was, you had some of the biggest, most powerful companies getting com private conversations with the interior secretary about who's going to get fast tracked and who's going to get access to the ARA money and such. So it kind of, kind of created, um, I don't know, it basically created a bunch of uh, contradictions, I think, in, in, in the deployment or it could have been done differently, I guess, is, is the, the upshot there. And then they, under the Obama administration, that was the Energy Policy Act of 2005, where that BLM mandate is in. And then under the Obama administration, they doubled it. And I have a graph. It's not in my, where do I have that graph? I, I was going to put it in the slides here. There are about half of the projects that were proposed on public lands and even got all their permits. That when They went all the way through the NEPA process, or if they were in California, they went through the CEQA process or in some cases they had to do both. Um, only half of them were built, even though they got all their permits, which is crazy because that means you put so many resources into the, this evaluation. Think about all the resources that BLM and Fish and Wildlife and all these agencies, I, you know, I spoken to them, they were like, I was, I, instead of working on a habitat mitigation plan I've been working on for the last 10 years, I suddenly got pulled off that project and was evaluating solar projects that were basically destroying habitat for these same species. I mean, one, one point I meant to make on my desert tortoise picture, and I'll, I'll shut up after this, was that we spend more money on the grizzly bear, bald eagle, and gray wolf on the desert tortoise. I'm sorry, we spend more money on the desert tortoise than those other three species. So, and here we are creating a mechanism to destroy their habitat somewhere else. So these, there's, there's kind of something going at odds, and, I, and just to, to finalize everything, really the action seems to happen at the state and public utilities commission. We don't get enough attention to those areas. Can I just make one yeah, really Julia quick follow Yeah, and then Deb, and then we'll come, we'll come So on. one thing that I like to um, remember is that we, the energy transition is happening quickly, and we are um, apparently decarbonizing at a rapid rate, mostly due to market-driven forces. Um, but it's not, the coal production is going to persist into the future for quite some time. So thinking about an opportunity to restructure the revenue opportunity around coal while it continues to exist in a way that provides for some transition for those places that aren't closing right now um, is a really important thing that I think could be supported at the federal level, but also needs to take place in state policy. So I have a question from online that I think might fit well into the to the discussion we've just been having. Um, this seems to, there seems to be a real need for incentives to accelerate green energy production, but are there good policy examples of green energy incentives that include habitat protections? Not, I have an idea here. In, it's not from, um, actually I, did, I think it did originate in legislation, but it basically in, um, 
Minnesota, in their power purchase agreements, they're, they're required to do vegetation disclosures about what, um, basically how they're gonna, how they're changing the landscape and their concern is pollinators and, and, and things like that. So, so there's a case where, you know, state legislatures could pass a law saying you have to think about carbon debts you might create from land use change or you might have to think about species or, or vegetation and in your contracting with, with um, you know, private developers and such. And, and perhaps even, you don't even need legislation to do that. You could just have the, the companies do that directly. I mean, it's a private contract. You can put whatever you want in it, I guess. Um, but that would be an example is, is kind of screening for that. And the problem is, and I think we have just become so obsessed with climate change, we don't think about all these other issues. We're just like, solar's good everywhere. And we don't think about habitat. We don't think about water use or some of these other things that are really important also to these areas. Kate, um, Marilyn. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to segue off on the uh, ownership of, of capital discussion for a minute. You know, looking at the picture here, I think that's a gas plant. I'm not sure, but it's big. And, you know, um, over the past several centuries, maybe 150 years or whatever it is, um, um, the um, technologies were such that the larger the plant, the better the economy is justifying monopoly power and uh, ownership of capital by small numbers of companies. Um, but now we've had, um, you know, the, the technology's been transformed and we can now do almost just as well with a highly distributed small scale um, energy uh, facilities, the possibilities uh, are even multiplied more with the development of the sharing economy, you know, where you've got uh, the ability to aggregate uh, across um, users and to sh use more of the capital that plants probably used, you know, on average, a plant is used something like 50% of the time. Um, if you look at hour, hour by hour, um, and you could have a plant that's used 100% of the time with peer-to-peer -peer sharing of electricity, for instance. I think that the biggest public need is for financing to allow that transition so that the ownership can be continued to transfer to smaller um, scale, um, more distributed energy systems. We can, you can, mm -hmm. What do you mean by financing? So in this case, uh, I would particularly like the public power model, and that's not going to fit everywhere. Where it does exist, um, it offers a lot. So, for instance, for uh, rural electric cooperatives, they can do on-bill financing. I would call that an inclusive financing approach. That is now, um, as long as you have a bill, you know, you don't even have to own your home. You can. Um, you can finance something, which could be the, the solar on top of your your living unit. Uh, now, if you do own your home, a city uh, could offer property assessed clean energy funds, which are levied against your property your property bill. So you can finance your investments through the longevity of your um, your mortgage. As another, I mean, the idea is to figure out how to make it. Um, no more costly than it is for you to pay your current bill. Only your current bill will be partly the financing charge for your improvements and the uh, ongoing uh, cost of the system. So the, I do think it's this type of um, um, inclusive financing that we, we need to work on. I am very worried, though, about the, the movement of the sharing economy to um, – not to ownership of the capital by everyone, but to ownership by a different set of business uh, intermediaries, you know, the Uber, the Lyft, the people who own homes that can offer Airbnb, and you know, it's just a whole different type of um, beneficiaries who have capital. It's not the millennials, you know, they don't want to participate and they don't necessarily want to own a car or a house. And at some point it may come back to bite them. They may find that they've been left out of all of the um, 
you know, profitable ways to, to make money from the, um, from the resources that they have at their disposal. If they don't invest anything in this economy. So, but it, I think that I like the idea of this inclusive financing as being a really important um, challenge for governments at all levels. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of want to follow up on the capital thing, and I also want to follow up. Some a caller mentioned the situation with First Nations in Canada, and said there's something instructive there. Sixties and seventies, there were a lot of major hydro projects in the James Bay region, north in Quebec, and in Manitoba, but also in Ontario, that really had one-sided agreements between the provincial entities, Crown corporations, and the uh, and the First Nations. That kind of came to a halt in 2004 when there was a, call, a court case of the Haida in British Columbia versus the, the province of British Columbia, principally the, the, the Ministry for Forestry there. And it was decided by the Supreme Court that uh, Indigenous peoples and First Nations on their lands had to have you know complete say over in terms of these uh, resources of extraction and environmental impacts, etc. And that led to a real slowdown in these negotiations. Some of them would take you know, almost a decade, nine years or more. But it also led to a situation where equity stakes and things like that, or um, how the development went was changed to protect cultural resources and things like that. It made for a much messier surface for negotiating. But in the end, the first, and it's not perfect as your caller mentioned, but it did, it is instructive. And if we look at the states, there's the Navajo uh, generating, coal-fired generating plant, which is scheduled to be closed, right? That's going to have a massive impact, massive impact on the Hopi and the Navajo. And that, but that was, in a sense, a, supposed to be a driver for some economic uh, resilience in, in that area. I, I think, you know, looking at those instances are, are, can be instructive in some ways, but in the other way, that's different than uh, private property and private mineral rights ownership, which you have in Appalachia mainly, right? And and they they're confronted with a different issue. So how do they how do they get equity stake? How do they make money on that? And and that's a that's a tricky one, right? I mean, one thing I would I wonder about is the states. States can have fees on how much oil is extracted, a per barrel cost, right? And California is very low. Some states are very high. You know, at the state level, do we look at enemy sur energy surcharges and agreements that will uh, increase capital flow to the uh, producing regions or demand equity? You know, and that that sort of out of our, our system really doesn't like things like that. And there's a natural resistance against taxes of any sort. But, you know, honestly, unless people in places like Appalachia take control of the resources, there you know they'll be mining until there's no more coal or there's no more demand, and then that's it. There's not no one's going to do anything for them. So I, I do think the First Nations and uh, those things are, are are worth looking at, but it's very different land ownership, and um, I think that in many areas it has to be a different way we approach it because there's no sovereign rights for most of the people that you talked about, Betsy. Do we need to take a deep breath? <laughs> oh, Bill. A little pile on. Uh, so, you know, I'm looking at this very simply. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm more of an urban guy, so forgive me. Uh, although my dissertation was on rural uh, hazards, chemical hazards. So, um, you know, a lot of the discussion that we've had you know, has focused on these sort of, you know, things like bankruptcy and financing, like, and real sort of elegant you know, and even sort of indigenous, you know, uh, land right questions and how to sort of maybe, I, what I interpreted what you were saying is sort of translate some of those experiences to the Appalachian context um, or, or sort of, you know, writ large. And really kind of, um, and I guess I'm, you know, maybe, uh, I'm not skeptical, I'm maybe pessimistic or something or, or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I just like, those things are, I guess the question I have is, you know, for the for the rural experts here, um, you know, how does that does does the the potential for progress and progressive, you know, 
politics. I mean, do you see it in the suite of these sort of kind of very, uh, at least as I interpret it quite simply, kind of very, um, um, you know, nuanced and sort of fairly sophisticated pieces of, of public policy. When I hear all about like these really blunt instruments, like a couple of days ago, you know, $2 trillion for, you know, infrastructure, that just sounds like a, you know, if that happens, a giant glob of money to do something that it's going to be fairly, you know, in, incoherent in terms of what that might be spent on. Or even the Green New Deal, which is also kind of a muddled kind of, you know, hazy vision of, you know, and where does the rural kind of context fit into those you know, that, that tension between like very nuanced policies that are context specific and you raise the issue of place versus like these these seemingly unending like giant globs of policy that are slapped on that don't really connect to place. Well, I'll start. Um, we don't like globs. We don't like globs of anything. And I won't say anything about, I think it's, I think it's $3 trillion infrastructure project. Uh, so, so one, one thing that I see happening, which is, you know, so incremental and, um, the problem with being a rural geographer is that we have nothing to say because we're such a small percentage of the population, right? It's like, we can't, we can't, we can't talk about sort of significance of developments, but, um, but out of crisis, I think, comes um, awakenings. And so just to take this issue of kind of sovereign ownership um, and, and some of the broad issues I laid out with respect to the limits that exist in policy with the ability for local governments to save money, to make investments, we're really seeing um, a resurgence of interest in the kinds of institutions you might associate with sort of Great Plains rural populism of, you know, kind of the early 20th century. So interest in state-owned banks, interest in local investment corporations, um, a big surge in community foundations. So then I would put on my other hat and just say, and this is partly responding to what Glenn said, we have to be really careful about distinguishing what we're asking public revenue to do lo and what we're asking local people to do, right? So I don't think we want these economies to be raising money to pay for the costs that remain on the landscape after development has happened. Um, and that's a big problem with state, a lot of the state severance tax kind of models is they pay for, they, they pay for the impact of development, but they don't leave you with anything at the end. Um, so then the question is, what kinds of investment strategies exist that allow you even to hold money? And then the question is, what do you invest in? Um, and I would say, I mean, I participate pretty actively in kind of the rural policy space, and I don't think anyone has the answer to that question. Um, and land reform would be a start, but I don't think we're going to get land reform in the United States anytime soon. And if we did do land reform in Appalachia, who would it go to, right? I mean, Euro-American settlers, that would be complicated. Um, so uh, thank you for allowing me that big picture kind of thing. But I, the, the summary point is that... Um, I think in the points of crisis, people do become policy literate. And one exciting thing is thinking about the ground up look at all the barriers there are to um, local retention of wealth. Betsy, did you want also re to respond to that? Again, this is all very contradictory and complex. Um, so. Let me just sort of describe some of the conversations I'm hearing. And there is an upsurgence of really quite radical thinking in some of the communities that I'm working with, especially among young people. So we're talking about people who have been displaced over generations. And at the same time, I, I don't want to romanticize this or exaggerate it, but there is a way in which Settler folks who have been here for some generations and were based on the land and have sort of deeply embedded cultural traditions do have a cultural sense of sovereignty. Now, this is in a very complicated and contested relationship with indigenous and Native American um, gr groups. And, and I think that's a conversation that is just starting to happen now in, in, in the more progressive Appalachian activism. Um, so that, you know, some, some tribes are now in Oklahoma who have historical connections to, to parts of Appalachia. And so there's a 
there's a great desire to establish very direct connections to talk about specific land. And some of the archaeologists actually are doing that. And part of the, but part of the reason people resist some of these questions about being settlers is that in the national American imaginary, up, hillbillies sort of fit that savage slot, right? So with, I think there is a sense that often hillbillies are asked, well, what about the Native Americans that you killed when they wouldn't say that in Manhattan, right? You know, so it, it's like, it's sort of like you can't have a hillbilly and an indigenous person in the same place because they're both actually connected to the land in some national imaginary. So I just want to throw that out there. But in terms of thinking about what sovereignty is, there is talk about an Appalachian Commons. I mean, really working in this this new in the in the land there to set up commons or mosaics of much more complicated structures. And also to say that if that land is stewarded as a carbon sink, that's a national service. So some of this, I don't know where this could go legally, but there's a lot of interest in what's happening in Scotland. Because there's some pretty fundamental land reform happening in Scotland, which is claiming sort of commons rights. Hmm. So it, it, the big need is for the kinds of collaborative spaces for conversations that, as Ostrom would say, this sort of diagnostic framework. And there's an urgent need for scholars like you all to help clarify what the policy alternatives are. But let these grassroots conversations drive what the questions are. Mm -hmm. So there's a great deal of technical information, that, uh, technical uh, advice that's needed. Thanks. We have, um, uh, we could continue with this, but we do have one more question from the, uh, from, from the outside that we'll try to work in. Okay, so one last question from the online. Um, so, Julia, one of your slides shows the real winner being natural gas. Um, aren't we really diversifying to natural gas, which is the most price sensitive and the most vulnerable fuel source to disruptions to, re to reduce our carbon footprint? I feel like I should probably let Marilyn answer that question. Um, and and that, that big surge of buildup that you see in natural gas capacity additions were in a different price and policy environment than what we have today. Um, I, I watch what's going to happen with exports and LNG facilities really, really carefully because there's a price differential across the Pacific that um, will, when when the technology exists for us to serve those markets, will really change um, what gas prices are like here today. But I don't, I feel really inadequate to answer that compared to Maryland. Boo deal. Um, I'm I'm just curious about. I'm just curious about, um, so a lot of these issues that we talked about, including habitat uh, protection, um, it seems like it's heavily focused on fossil fuels and then solar. But how about bioenergy? What, ab what about bioenergy? <laughs> <laughs> You mean biomass? I mean, yeah. there's been a, there's been a lot of work looking at you know the ethanol fuel standard and and its implications for um, agricultural systems. You know, most of the drive. So so the like there's been a big plow up in in the Great Plains on the western edge of the Great Plains, and that's um, heavily attributed both to high commodity prices and the fuel ethanol standard um, with major consequences. So a great place if you're interested in that is the World Wildlife Foundation. Prints uh, creates what they call a plow print, which uses a variety of uh, spatial data sets to calculate the loss of uh, native grassland habitat in the Great Plains, for example. And of course, it's not carbon neutral. You know, you know that. But there are a lot of uh, interesting new technologies being developed. I'm sure Oak Ridge has their fair share. Georgia Tech's got a bunch of them as well. 
where we think that you could uh, no a lot of money pump being pumped in which you know could be the basis of a, some sort of a, a rural renaissance i'm not sure i'm not myself investing in them but uh, hoping <laughs> hoping i'm wrong <laughs> well i think like we have an algal biofuel research at msu and um in our i'm part of a big integrated assessment project looking at the bex economy in the great plains and one of the places that they're looking for algae to do interesting work is as a fertilizer alternative, which has all sorts of like interesting energy system kind of dynamics within it. Um, again, who's going to own the technology and the production? But uh, I think there's lots of exciting space there. Well, once again, I hate to um, cut us off when, when things are still just rolling, rolling fast, but we have run out of time. And so I'd, I'd like to first thank our speakers, Julia and Betsy and Dustin. Thank you so much. This was really interesting. And then we, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us here and not here. And we have um, a tremendous food for thought and a lot, of, a lot of new questions opened. And hopefully we can move forward on this in some way that would be really productive and helpful. I, 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 um, I, I'm warned, though, by Betsy's uh, mention of the word panacea that we aren't going to get there. <laughs> but thank you again. Thank you so much. This has been a really interesting meeting. Thanks. <laughs>